Oh, howdy, folks. I do a little bit of a pause there because there's like a delay before the stream actually starts moving. And, uh, but I, I kind of struggle with not wanting to delay too long because, uh, actually, a lot of people view my videos on YouTube after the fact. And, uh, the export tool from Twitch to YouTube doesn't allow me to chop off the be the beginning part. So, at least I don't know how to do it yet. If someone knows how to do that, let me know. Uh, I'd want to do it direct from Twitch to YouTube rather than having to re-upload the video, edit it or not. Um, so, anyway. So, last 71 videos, for the first 70 of them, I was basically building up my own web server. And I took then a month off to do planning and research because, as I talked about in my last stream, 71, I uh, wanted to switch from just working on a web server to building a game. I'm going to be using the web server and the other little bits and pieces I made for it to uh, build up the game because the game is going to be online and multiplayer. There's going to be a lot of server-side components. And, you know, for example, all of the communication between the game servers is going to be through the web. So each game server is going to be a web server and it's going, they're all going to talk to each other through um, web sockets and stuff. So they're also going to be clients. And of course, on the client side, they'll connect to the server through the web as well. So if you're interested in sort of more of the background of the game I'm about to write, I haven't written it yet. This is very, very early. Um, check out my last stream or the recording of it on YouTube. And oh, I'm getting a message, so hold on. I'm, I'm also switching Twitch chat clients. So, oh, you know what it is? The stream elements is uh, putting my name in there. Hmm. I don't want stream elements to be interrupting me a lot. Anyway, where was I? Yeah, so the last video, I kind of chatted for about 20 minutes because I only had a little bit of time yesterday and uh, I chatted about what I planned to do. And I realized today I need to record a new intro video for people who kind of jump in here and are not sure what, what I'm doing and would rather watch an intro rather than read um, questions or ask questions. So I'll, I'll need to do that, but just a really brief overview. Making a game that's multiplayer and the servers are gonna be hosted on Amazon Web Services Cloud. So if, uh, and all I have uh, written down is in OneNote and it's all publicly readable. So there's a link on my Twitch page. Um, somewhere below my, somewhere below in the panels, there's a link to the notebook. And right here under Notes, Omni Arrhenia System Architecture and Realm Server Architecture, I kind of had little diagrams showing what are the different pieces and how they fit together. But just from a very top level, client is going to be your web browser. Let me arrange my windows here. A web browser running JavaScript. It's going to be connecting into the game servers, which there will be multiple of them. And the idea there is to load balance and also have fault tolerance. And so they're going to be talking to each other to maintain... I used to use the word coherence, but now I, I learned a, a better word. Let me find out what that word is. I want to use the correct word. Where did I, put, did I put that in today's log? No, I put it in my panels. I gotta look at my own panels. Hold on. Shoot, that means I need to open my own channel. Okay, pro, pro streamer here. <laughs> um, hold on, hold on. Consensus. So consensus is the new word I want to train myself to use. The Servers here maintain or, or achieve and maintain consensus, as in they all agree what is the state of the game. So they each get a copy of the game state, so that any any client can talk to any server and get a, an up to date picture of the state of the game. Right? I hate multiple pixels. So just a, a fair warning: uh, I might not get ch to see chat right away because I'm trying to switch to a new chat client and. I'm used to audio cues to let me know when to check chat, and so I'm not I'm not going to get an audio cue unless you um, tag me in the message. So if if um, I if you're if you say hi and I don't respond, try again with the tag maybe. 
So anyway, yeah. My game's going to have multiple servers for fault tolerance, but in order for it to work, they have to be that they have to achieve consensus about the game state. And so a streamer I follow, uh, Adam13531, he pointed me to a really great document that I put in the notes here. It's about raft. So let's let me let me just bring this up because I think it's a a cool um thing to show. Move to a new window, yes. And put it over here. So the raft consensus algorithm. So I won't go into the in, the, into the nitty-gritty details. I'll just show you this cool picture. So let's imagine I had five game servers and a client could talk to any one of them, although the, their, their algorithm is kind of strict and they say all clients go through one guy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit flexible and uh, see how that goes. But um, the five servers coordinate and keep consistent uh, um, the, um, consistent notion of the current game state by by using an algorithm that's called raft and you can see here this server s4 is the leader so it's a one leader everyone else is a follower and let's say i crashed the leader these little circles are indicating timeout timers and when they time out they all basically start an election to see who should take over as the leader the idea is the leader is the one who's making the decision on what is the game state at a, every point, and all the followers are basically just getting copies. So you see here, S2 took over as the leader, and if I then turn S4 back on, it has an old idea of what the state is, but as soon as it gets a message from the new leader, it says, okay, I, I'm up to date now. So not to go into great detail, but I'm going to be using much of this algorithm. So if you're interested in the algorithm details, raft.github.io would be the place to look it up. And then if you want, want to get really deep into it, there's a Wikipedia page about it. And let me uh, show that briefly. And then there is a white paper if you get really deep into it. And it's not too bad of a white paper. They got diagrams and stuff, so. Yeah, I encourage you to read it if you're inter interested in algorithms. So anyway, the plan is to have multiple game servers that use Raft or something like Raft or Raft with a little cha a bunch of changes to fit my, what I want uh, to maintain consensus. And uh, one one thing I'm adding to the picture is this thing called the orchestrator, and that's mostly my own idea i don't know if it's a great one but that something has to make sure or something has to do the launching of the servers based on the configuration i have set and i thought the, the most convenient way that i could think of is to have uh, a system server so like if it was in linux it would be registered with system d or on the mac it would be registered with launch d and on windows it would be a a Windows service. So it's always running and its only job is just to make sure that there are the correct number of Realm servers running and that they're all not frozen, not crashed. So if any are frozen, it'll kill them. If any crash, it'll restart them. And it'll also give them any new updates. So it'll be my part of my distribution plan. I'll have a special client that knows how to get to the orchestrator and I'll use it to push updates to the code and or the configuration. So the Realm servers don't have to kind of figure that on their own. They're kind of just uh, told about any new code or, or configuration updates from the orchestrator. But uh, the orchestrator doesn't know anything about the game state. Clients don't directly talk to it normally. And so it, it, it doesn't really do much. All the magic is in these Realm servers. So that's why I have the second picture about what the different parts of the Realm server are going to be. This HTTP server part is what I did for the last 70 streams. So it's the web server, web tech. And off of that, I'm building different components. They all chain together. And I won't talk about it too much here because I talked about it last stream. But um, if, if you have questions, let me know. I'm going to be focusing on coordinator and then um, up here, the orchestrator, because that's sort of the first step is in order for me to talk to the servers, I need to have something that's listening. And the coordinator is the one that's going to be setting up to listen for connections and respond using a web server to do that. 
And um, side note is this web gate is really just there because I have uh, three ports per server. There's the private end, the public end, and then a special well-known port. So to kind of aggregate those three into one, I have, that's why I have this web gate, which is pretty much already written. I wrote some of this without streaming because I didn't have the whole architecture figured out, and I thought it would be kind of boring to stream the architecture. So I kind of did that last month. And once I had a pretty firm plan, I'm like, okay, I'll start coding, and then I should probably be streaming it too. So anyway, let's get to the coding. So if you haven't seen this kind of code before, I use test-driven development. So if I collapse all this, you'll see the first thing I do is I write tests. And I'm using a framework from Google called Google Test. It's also called gtest, so I'm pulling in their library. And that defines these macros, which allow me to construct tests that are run. So if I go to the, my command line, and I type, I go into my build directory and type ctest. It's going to pretty much using Google test framework. Can't think of a better word, but it'll discover all these individual tests, run them and kind of keep track of how many of them passed, how many of them failed, and they're all passing. And if we wanted to get more detail, I could run, let's see, this is the realm server test, realm server test. You can see for each individual test, when it started running, whether it passed or failed, and how long the, the test took, and then a total, and the total time, which is kind of cool. If any tests fail, we get even more information. So for example, if I, let me pick a test here and change an expectation, just, just flip it from true to false, right? Build, the build, build, the, okay. And then I run it again, you can see that this test is now failing and tells us what line it failed on what the actual value was and what we expected. And you can see, oh, okay, we expected false, it was actually true. And then we, we go to that line 192 and say, okay, why did it kind of reason out why it failed? Usually I can figure it out. And either it's a problem with the test or the problem with the code. Either way you fix it and run it again. So yeah, the order of operations is we build these tests first, then we write the code to make the test pass because there's no code Number one, the test isn't even going to compile. And meant to get it to minimally compile, we just fill in the functions that are missing and just keep them empty. And the functions aren't doing what you need them to, so of course the test is going to fail. Then you put in the contents of the functions, the actual work, until you get the test to pass. And um, then it, you go back to writing more tests, and it kind of goes in a loop. And then later, once you think you're done and you run it on... Um, like for real and you, let's say you find a bug what you want to do with test driven development is try to make a new test that reproduces or recreates the bug in a, in a very small context so sometimes they're called unit tests where we're just testing one unit of the architecture and you'll see it fail because you reproduce the bug fix the bug to make the test pass and then continue the idea is over time you build up this this huge um, library of tests which kind of continuously makes sure your code is doing the right thing. So if you go and try to clean up the code or make it more efficient or optimize it and your tests start to fail, you'll, you'll know you broke something. So it's kind of a nice uh, safety net. Anyway, that's the the uh, my spiel today for today for test-driven development. So right now for the coordinator, uh, actually I should just explain precisely what the coordinator does. So I have here that it configures and operates the web gate to communicate with the orchestrator, other realm servers, both within the same realm and other realms, and clients. So what that means is it's basically the front end of the server. Although well, it's kind of weird to say that because usually server is thought of as back end. But it's the, it's, the, it's the doorway into the server. It has to set up the web servers, web servers know nothing about the game or the content of messages. They're just transport. They, they're the, the, the vehicle that's allowing messages to come in and, and pass messages back out. Coordinator's got to set them up, you know, set, choose the port numbers, and then um, set up something to handle any, income requ any incoming requests. And then when requests do come in, it's got to interpret them. So. The way it's going to interpret it in my game is it's going to pass along 
messages meant for the rest of the game server and messages that don't make sense it'll return an error message and then messages that are meant for doing the raft um, the uh, consensus like the election of leaders etc cetera, etc cetera, it's going to handle uh, most most of it's going to handle by itself but it might need help from the uh, reconciler because the reconciler has access to the journal which if you look at the raft stuff they call it the log log journal same thing it's the idea about uh, what actions happen to build up the game state. So the idea of consensus is you want all the servers to agree that about the same game state, which means the same log or the same journal of changes to the game. So the coordinator is going to have to go consult the uh, reconciler or the journal. This, this they actually might draw a direct line here to make it simpler. Um, it's going to consult it to um, um, as needed as part of the algorithm. Uh, some steps of the algorithm require knowing, like, what was the last journal entry or log entry, and um, uh, uh, what um, what leader was in power at the time. They call it term, so which term we're in. So yeah, that's what the coordinator is. Right now, you can see all I'm testing is that we can configure, mobilize, and demobilize. I use these words, mobilize and demobilize, um, specifically implying that the object's going to go from being a passive object that just sits there and does nothing to it's going to be doing some work and not necessarily in the foreground, probably some background work. So it's sort of like a saying you're committing that to, to, to start operating, which means I usually want to have a demobilize to, to shut it down. And I try to keep that separate from the life cycle of the object. So in other words, you would first construct the object, then you'd mobilize it, and then it runs, and then demobilize, and then finally destroy. So that, that allows the constructor and the destructor to remain pretty simple because they're operating on a, a passive object. And um, yeah, I think it's just better that way. So all we can do right now is set it up, mobilize, and demobilize it. So what's the next thing I want to do with it? Probably I want to, let me think about this. Actually, I had it in today's plan, didn't I? Set up the coordinator to accept WebSocket connections. So, like the diagram showed here, the coordinator, okay, this is the wrong symbol. I changed my mind here. It's not going to, um, ha uh, the web gate is not going to be a part of the coordinator. The coordinator is going to aggregate the web gate. So this should be a, a hollow diamond, not a filled diamond. So we're going to be going to the web gate. I, I believe I already have that API in there. Let's look at the web gate. WebGate. So yeah, I have this set WebSocket delegate. This sets the function to call whenever a new WebSocket connection is established with the server. So we need the coordinator to call this, passing in a delegate. So delegate is just a fancy word for a callback function. And the callback function we got to construct so that it takes this new WebSocket and then figures out what to do with it. So we have to figure out, well, who is it? And do we already have a connection with them? Therefore, we don't need to keep two connections open, so we shut one of them down. And um, we put it in the right place. So we're, I expect that the coordinator is going to have to track connections from other servers. Actually, it's sort of indicated here, right? Other, other servers, clients, and also from the orchestrator. So all these are web sockets. Now, at first, when a, when a connection comes in, you don't know who it's from. Um, the only thing that we get with the WebSocket delegate is whether it came in on a private port or not. So if it's private, we know it's either another Realm server or the orchestrator. If it's pub public, we know it's a client. So we can we can say it's an unknown client until they identify themselves. If it's private, we we can say it's it's not a client. We still need to to wait and see well, who is who is it, which other server, or is it the orchestrator? So I think what we'll do is when a WebSocket comes in. We'll first put it into like a lobby area or like an unknown identity area until they identify themselves. So let's see how, how do I want to structure this. Make a test first. So the word here, the test is, is sort of to sum up what we, or what the use case is. So let's call the use case, um, you kind of want to keep the web, the use cases uh, focused so like a connection from the, the orchestrator would be multi-step first the web socket comes in then they identify themselves as being the orchestrator 
So that it feels to me like that should be. Am I holding my hands up so you can see? Hold on. <laughs> Gotta get used to the. I hold if I if I say two, but I hold my hand down here. You don't know I'm saying two. So there are two, two steps to that, which means I want to have two tests. So we'll say a new WebSocket. New WebSocket is probably fine. And then another test, uh, I can just paste, can't I? And say, orchestrator identified. So this test will be a new WebSocket comes in. And this is that a WebSocket that came in and hasn't, the, the other end hasn't identified themselves, is now identifying themselves as being the orchestrator. And so we properly um, put them in the right bin, so to speak. I'm wondering if we should have two cases there because they could identify themselves and it's the first time we've seen it, or they could it could be a second WebSock connection from some something that identifies itself as the orchestrator, which which could happen, right? The first orchestrator might have gotten locked up and well could it? If it got gets locked up, then um I think what we want to do is have an alert go out to to the admin. The admin should kill it and restart it, which means it, the yeah okay. So I don't think we need to ever worry about two orchestrators because the first orchestrator, if it goes away, it's going to go away completely before the new one comes in. So this is probably good. Okay, so new WebSocket. So we need to uh, let me let me show a, a better example here. This is one way to organize a unit test is to break it down to three distinct areas that have different aspect or different attributes. So arrange, act, assert. Uh, arrange, you're supposed to set things up for the test, but not actually do the use case, not, not do the things which either return what you're testing or, or cause side effects that, that you're going to test. Those belong in act. And then assert is to like a, after the fact, like debrief, like did did it happen the way we expect? And some of the characteristics here that I like to put in are arrange. You should never have an expect or assert. So basically, we say we ex we assume this will all happen correctly. If it didn't, that some other test should have caught it. And act just does the thing. It might have an expect or an assert if there's a return value, but my for example, my demobilize doesn't return anything, so I don't have an uh, expectation. Then assert is just going to like check different side effects here, because since demobilize doesn't return anything, the only way we can check if it worked is through side effects. I think I probably forgot to mention expect, and sometimes you'll see assert. Those are built-in macros in Google Test that are used to um, cause the test to fail if something doesn't match which, what it should be. And expect will fail the test, but continue running the test in case there are multiple failure points. Assert will, if it fails, it'll stop right away. So if you see me use assert false or assert true, it's usually because it doesn't make sense to continue the test if it failed at that one point. Here, none, none of these side effects really are directly tied to each other, so I just use expect for all of them. Okay, enough explaining. Uh, let's do the same kind of setup. So arrange, how do we arrange? Oh, I'm in the wrong test. How do we arrange for a new WebSocket? We need to actually mobilize the coordinator. So I'll just steal from I'll steal from here. So just everything that we did in the previous test becomes the arrange for this test and we don't need to check return values. We just assume it works. It's kind of a handy thing so that the tests kind of build off of each other. And we can drop all the expectations here. And there we go, there's our range, at least for mobilizing. So, it's not good enough just to mobilize. We need to, actually no, it is, it is good enough to mobilize. Right, so the test if about a new WebSocket being accepted is, is we try to connect with the WebSocket. So I need to know what port number did I tell it to use? Uh, let's just expand all here and look, look at that. 
So we're telling, where is it? Telling the web server. Oh, I should qualify this. This is new WebSocket from Orchestrator. Or new, or new WebSocket from private. We're going to connect on the private port. So what is the private port? And by the way, if I go too quick here um, and you have a question, just ask it. I will try to keep uh, an eye on the, for me it's over there, the uh, chat window. If you, again, if you don't uh, get a response from me, try tagging me in, your, in the message. That sends a tone, so I should, should grab my attention. So if we're using the server instance zero, the private port's 8182. So we're going to, when we act, we're going to set up a WebSocket. Uh, let's call it Orc for Orchestrator. And I think we just want to directly open it, don't we? Okay, we need a connection. So, orc WebSocket has an orc connection. I'll just, I feel like abbreviating today. And it needs a role. So if you're curious about WebSockets, um, let's see. How do I have two? Okay. I, I wrote these web, the WebSocket stuff from scratch around stream 29. So you can go back in my YouTube to uh, find that if you're interested. WebSocket role client. So we need a connection as well. So that I think I have arranged here. Oh, wait, no, we don't, we don't need to open one. Um, hold on, let me think about this. Yeah, I think, hold on, wait a minute. I have the, I, um, I didn't explain what a mock is, but when you're making unit tests, you're basically taking one component and trying to test it in isolation. So instead of the real web gate, I have a mock web gate, so it, it has the same interface as the real web gate, but it just pretends to do what it's told. It makes it easier, so I'm looking at this saying, our unit item test is going to call this um, to set up its delegate, and we're going to call the delegate back and give it, we have to give it a web socket, which is the server side of the socket, and um, but but in order for the web socket to work, it needs to have a um, a connection which doesn't really go to a real network, but is a yeah. We, so we need a mock connection object. Let me. I could probably steal that from my the unit test for websock for websockets itself, right? Probably have a mock connection. Yeah, look at that. I have a mock connection. So we're gonna steal that mock and put it in our coordinator tests. I'm really into software reuse, so you'll see me copy things around from different tests, and uh, when I do refactoring, I try to um, collapse the copies together into libraries, uh, trying to make them so that I can um, reuse them, use them in other places, so I don't have to always start from scratch. Um, and the ultimate reuse is to publish it, which is uh, to make a library that you put on a GitHub so that other people can use it. Okay, so it's this is a fake connection object which is used to facilitate a data or message message flow into and out of web sockets and given to the unit under test. So basically the coordinator thinks it's talking to a real network, but it's actually talking to a pretend network 
and the most of the network pretending is going to be done by this mock connection. So we don't need this kind of stuff, do we? I'll keep it in there for now. Why not? So when we um, hold on, yeah. So when the coordinator actually sends a message back to like the orchestrator or a client, it's going to be calling send data. And what it's go what's going to do is it's going to end up the mock just captures it in this string, and our our unit test will just look at that string and say, well, did the coordinator send the right message, right? And when we want to send a message to the coordinator, we will call the data received delegate. So that's the delegate the coordinator gave us so that we can call it when it needs to receive some data. So yeah, so let's make, so the thing we would do here is we would make a new one. Const, and we're going to share it with the web socket. So it needs to be a shared object. I like to use auto a lot. You'll see me use auto when I don't want to repeat the type name twice in a statement. I know I'm going to have to use it in the right-hand side of my statement. So on the left-hand side, I start with auto. So auto, this is, what did I call it? Orc con. So it's standard make shared mock connection. All right, and that should all resolve. So now we've given, we've made a fake connection. We've given it to a real WebSocket and told the real WebSocket, um, actually, I think we need to, we're going to give this to the coordinator. So it's got to act like a server, right? Actually, now that I think about it, we probably want to have two WebSockets so that we don't have to uh, decode the WebSocket protocol. Let me think about this. Ah, let's just let we'll do that in a bit. I'll actually show you um, the problem when when we run into it, and we'll solve it when we run into it. I'm just looking ahead and thinking about the problem I'm going to run down the road. And that the uh, WebSocket server side is going to send us data that's in the WebSocket protocol. And there's uh, sort of outside the scope of this component to, to worry about that. So I kind of want it to, to be decoded as if it um, came out the other end. And reciprocal, like when I send in a message, I want to send it in, not have to worry about the encoding of it. Anyway, so we're going to open the WebSocket. Now, here's where we want to... Um, actually, let's. we have to make this into two steps, don't we? Because I'm about... Okay, I'll just... I'll, I'll write what I was going to write. The coordinator... Oh, uh, sorry. The um, mock web gate will have recorded a uh, WebSocket delegate. Okay, we haven't done that. We haven't done it. So we're going to record this. So web socket delegate. This function, the coordinator should call to give us the function that we need to call back when a connection comes in. So um, we, we store it and then call it back. So here's where we're going to store it. And then here's where we're going to call it back. And we are going to pass the WebSocket, and then whether it's private or not. So it's private in this test. So the problem is, how do we know that um, this is null or not? I think that should be just another unit test. So let's quickly do that. So we'll call it WebSocket Delegate Registered upon mobiliz mobilization. So that's what we expect. So it'll be pretty much this down to the assert will be that we expect a false that um, actually we don't even need to do it's actually part of mobilize isn't it no 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 yeah isn't it's actually part of mobilize I could put it into the mobilize test eh, let's keep it separate so there really is no act because it just should it should have done it once we've arranged mobilize, which is already tested. So assert false that mock web gate web delegate is equal to null pointer. So this test should uh, 
it's just making sure that's not null, so here we don't have to worry if it's null or not. Now what's this error that's telling me? Oh, it want, the argument type is the WebSocket. Okay, that, that's wrong. We need to fix that. Oh, it wants a shared pointer. Okay, fine. We can do that. Just turn this around to be a make shared. So, we need to turn this into an arrow. Now we're good. What does it return? It returns a function? Really? No, it returns void. It's weird. It doesn't show it, but it, uh, does it show it here? Oh, it's in the dot dot dots. So we can't see that. Yeah, there's, there's no return value from the, from the, um, delegate call. So how are we going to test that it worked? Good question. Oh, I know. We'll actually just send it a message and expect a response. So assert. So we need we need to send it. We need to send a message that we know the coordinator will be able to understand. So I don't have any code at all. So something simple might be just like a. I'm thinking ping, but the WebSocket itself will handle ping. So we need something the coordinator will handle that the WebSocket won't handle internally. I guess we can just invent the... Uh... Oh no, that's what... I was going to say the identification message, but that's what this test is going to do. Um... So one thing we could do is have a back door into the coordinator that we can ask it how many connections it has. I guess that's not too bad. All right, we could do that. So let's do that. So let's expect equal one coordinator uh, dot. And then we need to invent something like get uh, get unidentified or get num unidentified identified private connections. Because I'm envisioning that when the connection comes in until the other side identifies themselves, it'll be kind of kept in a pool of, here are some connections that have, I don't know who I'm talking to yet. And we'll be able to use this backdoor method to count them. So in general, it's okay to have backdoor functions at the component level, because they're simply just not used by the other components. You can reinforce that by having this backdoor function inside the implementation of the class. So if I look here, the actual uh, final class, rather than it being in the interface. So if we define it in class coordinator, but not an I coordinator, then it won't be able to be used from reconciler or webgate, but um, we can use it from our tests because our tests know they're dealing with the final class. So let's do that. So let's make this a member of the final class right here. So it's going to return a size T. Might as well make it const and say this method returns the number of web... Do remember to keep WebSocket capitalized because it's a proper name. It's one of those weird ones where most places I've seen they capitalize it. I think it's because it's a proper name. Returns the number of WebSocket connections the coordinator currently has open. From connections from unidentified private clients, e.g. orchestrator, orchestrator or or other realm server. Okay, and then it simply returns. Uh, I usually just repeat this. Oh, thanks for following. Uh, I'm having trouble with your name. Atepi? I hope I got that right. Thanks for following. The number of WebSocket 
from socket connections. So, I mean, people might find this lame, but I do repeat sometimes in my documentation. And the reason for that is potentially, in my mind, a tool that will um, look at this documentation might take this paragraph and this paragraph and send them different places. So this might end up in a summary and this might end up in the details page. And so depending on where the reader of the documentation is looking, uh, I want them to see the meaning of the return value in both places, so I just repeat myself. Sort of a lame excuse, probably, but eh, it doesn't cost me much to to repeat in the documentation because I don't expect this ever to change. Okay, so subscribe, so it belongs roughly here. Coordinator. So we're going to lie at first just to get it to compile, and I'll show you. We just say zero, right? This should now compile. Whenever I say should, half of the time I'm wrong. Um, but it did this time, and now we can run the unit test. Again, we can see it's failing. It actually fails from the two tests we made. So, we're not, we're, it's not accepting a web uh, WebSocket, and, oh yeah, it's because it never did register a delegate, which made sense. You can see actually, since this test failed, the did it register a delegate? This one's not only going to fail, it's going to crash because we're calling a null, a null pointer. It's okay that we don't check for null pointer because this test is the one that already did it. It doesn't make much sense for two tests to check the same thing, so I tend to, to keep it more readable. I will generally um, do the null pointer check one place and then everywhere else just assume we can call it. That makes it so we can just focus on the use case at hand and not be distracted by extraneous things like, hey, is it null? Do we need to check or not? Okay, so let's fix them one at a time. So the WebSocket delegate's easy to do. We just need to have, when in Mobilize, have it call the set delegate method, right? So where's Mobilize? Here's Mobilize. So let's have it do that as one of the things it does before the end. This function is already kind of long, so I'm thinking I might want to refactor it. I, you know, I wonder if this will help me develop a better habit about refactoring. If I if I put comments here to say what it's doing, maybe the the blocks that have comments later, I'll come back and refactor them out as separate functions. So what I want to say here is uh, configure. Are we just configuring? Yeah, configure the web gate. And then register our delegate to uh, receive new WebSocket connections. So the idea is, if I, once I go back here and refactor at some point, I want to move that all into one function and the, what I'm going to write here into a separate function, so it's easier to read. But for now, I just want to get things working. So um, there's a there's a saying in computer science, right? First, make it work then make it right, then make it fast. So I'm on step one, making it work. So it doesn't have to be right or fast. Making it right would be to refactor them out into different functions, and of course re making it fast would be going and optimizing things. So I'll probably be working for a long time just on step one, making it work, just in general for the game, and then make it right... Um, probably shift to making things right when I'm starting to uh, leverage and build upon and reuse stuff. I want to make it right before I do that. Making it fast, I don't need to worry about until I run into performance issues, right? So no early optimization, that that, that rule. Okay, return, register our delegate. I know I'm ranting a lot today. It might be because I haven't streamed in like a month, and I feel like I got to rehash some of the things I talked about in my previous streams just to just to get it freshened up again. Okay, so the delegate is going to be in the web gate. So the web gate already has it set up for us to call. It's set. We just need to give it something. So what do we give it? Web gate is going to be something that we aggregate. But um, we're going to definitely release it before we're destroyed. So it, I think it's safer to give it 
a function which captures this. I've gotten into trouble a lot in the past making lambda functions that capture this, and then passing them off to other components, which then at some point later try to call it after this has been destroyed. Horrible things happen. But So now I stop and I have to think, am I giving it to something that will only live less than or equal to the life cycle of this? And I think the answer here is yes. So what does the WebSocket delegate want? Or what is it given? It's given the WebSocket. So if I wanted to just do it inline, it would be this. And that's enough to satisfy it, right? So uh, test-driven development, you just do minimal code to make the test pass. And then if you feel like you're missing code, you will go back and write tests for that, right? So that's minimally passing one of our tests. The next one is that um, it reports that we actually have received it. So it's when we receive it, we need to put it somewhere so that when we're asked how many we have, we can say how many we have. So let's do the how many we have first. Let's say we're going to have some collection called unidentified private connections. And we're just going to ask it, what's its size, right? And because this could be called from another thread, I think we want to get some thread safety in here while we're at it. So thread safety involves including mutex. And where's a good spot to put this? Probably, probably here. This doesn't need a mutex. So we can declare the mutex my thinking is I declare it above the things which are going to be protected by it. So let's just start with it just being a normal mutex. I'll say this is used to synchronize access to pro to the properties below. Okay. And then here, before we um, access it, we need to make a lock guard of the type of the mutex. Uh, impulse mutex. Call I like to call it just lock. So what a lock guard does is it takes the mutex and locks it in its constructor. When it gets destroyed, so when this lock goes out of scope, it automatically unlocks the mutex. So it's uh, R A I I. Your resource acquisition is initialization. In other words, you can look that up if you haven't heard that before, but. That means we don't have to manually lock and then remember to unlock it in all the correct places. It's auto, kind of automatic, so which is nice. Okay, so that's one place. The other place is where we're going to use it down here. And that is... We're going to... Um, same name here. I'm thinking we'll just keep it simple for now and have it be a set. So the thing you do with sets is you call insert and you just insert the WebSocket, right? So let's actually define that thing. Standard set um, of something is that. Set, I do not have the include for that, so we pull it in. And what is it a setup? It's a set of shared pointers uh, to uh, web sockets, right? And then let's say what it is here. And that's still, oh, one more. So side notes, uh, you might be wondering why I put spaces here. The reason is I, I just have this habit based off of old C++ where if you didn't do that, let's say you, you just collapse these. Before C++11 or, or maybe it was uh, before C++0x, and all that. If you did this, the compiler could get confused because it might think that that's one token, which is the shift right. So I just got into the habit of always putting white space inside the brackets. I think it also, for me, it makes it easier to see that that here's one unit and then here's another one, just based off of just eyeballing the spaces. But, you know, your mileage may vary. You may or may not like that. That's fine. So this is the set of WebSocket connections that have been established at uh, two 
established have been established with unknown parties probably either the orchestrator or other realm servers that have not yet identified themselves so I qualified with private because I'm kind of looking ahead knowing that I'll, I'll want the same thing for public connections and I'm keeping them separate because there are going to be different rules right so a private connection do, we probably don't need to authenticate because it's uh, not accessible from outside and public we do need to authenticate we need to uh, to make sure they are who they say they are because we don't want just anyone claiming to be a, a, a player and then have them just anyone log in and you know sell all their loot or whatever so public connections we need to auth authenticate somehow and um private connections we don't need to they just need to identify themselves yeah i'm the orchestrator and it should be trustworthy because the only thing that can get to a private port is other things inside the server infrastructure all right so is that it the connection comes in we put it in the set And then if we're asked how many we have, we get its size. That should work. That's not completely correct. We'll have to write more unit tests in a second. It's correct so far, but you know what comes to mind when we insert what should what should come to your mind when you see like an insert is where is the remove? We also we always want to kind of have a, have a balance. Sometimes you can rely on the destructure to just just. Um, release it for you, but I kind of like to have a balance. Oh, sorry, I didn't see the chat from five minutes ago. Determinist, can you fix Fallout 2 online game? Sorry, I can't fix Fallout 2. Sorry. I would if I could. What's the problem with Fallout 2 online game? If you're still here, um, I'm kind of curious now what, what what's broken with it. Yeah, and uh, I should say again, um, to anyone who's watching, I'm getting used to using a new chat client, and that one does not give me an audio cue when you chat. So if you, if you feel like I'm ignoring you, it's not that. It's that I just simply didn't see your chat. And um, you can always tag me in the message, and that will make a little audio cue for me, and I'll, I'll look over and I'll read it. So yeah, sorry if you um, feel like you're being ignored. It's not on purpose. All right. Yeah, so when I look at this, I'm always thinking, where is the remove or erase that balances that out? So so I think the way we would naturally expect this to happen is when, if, if something that hasn't yet identified themselves simply disconnects, we kind of expect that connection to be dropped, right? So let's put that in here. We will say, again, with this, where is it? Okay, we'll just say, unidentified private connection dropped when disconnected. All right, and so it's gonna be the same setup. Only all the act stuff moves into a range and we get rid of any asserts we had, which we didn't. And the act will be, we will simply disconnect the socket. So the way that happens is we, through the web socket, we call the broken, where is it? Where did I put it? Did I not save it? Oh, uh, no, it's not through their website. It's through the connection. Their connection, we call the broken delegate. Basically, it's an indication from the network side that connection is lost, and the web socket should respond back to the orchestrator or the co co coordinator and say, yeah, connection's been dropped. And I think the argument is whether or not it was clean. So we'll say it's not clean. And so the check will be that it went, it goes to zero. So right now, if we try this, I bet you it's going to fail. Sure enough, it fails. So um, instead of scrolling here, another trick you can do with gtest is you do dash s gtest underscore filter equals, and then just put in some something that we can match against this. Dropped. It's probably good enough. 
There we go. So we can see we expected zero connections and it was one. So how are we going to fix it? The cleanest way would probably be, be after inserting it, we should probably register a closed delegate. Okay. Uh, need to see what the prototype is for closed delegate. What does it expect? Okay, so it returns nothing, but gets two arguments. So, gets nothing, returns two. Oh, returns nothing, but has two arguments. So, something like that. So, what do we want to do in here? Probably do this, right? In order to get access to that, we would need to capture this, which is a problem. I'll get to that in a second. But essentially, we want to erase. We don't have the WebSocket either, and that's another problem. So I'm going to solve this one because it's easier. It would be a bad idea to capture this, uh, to capture WS, because we're passing it to WS. That's a circular reference, so to speak. So what I'm going to do is have a weak pointer. So standard weak pointer to a web socket. This is how you use a weak pointer. You just construct it with a strong pointer and then before and then you recover it in here. So you would say const auto ws equals ws weak dot lock. And then if it's null pointer, that means that the WebSocket was destroyed by the time you handled this. So, which actually shouldn't happen, but it's a good idea to always check and you just do nothing. You just return early. And that's fine because if it doesn't exist anymore, it means it never got into this collection, so we don't need to try to erase it. So the second problem is the this. Problem is the WebSocket could actually live longer than our coordinator, so... I think what we want to do is kind of separate the coordinator's private properties into those that whose lifetime is restricted to the coordinator's lifetime and then those properties which could extend beyond. So we'll make a structure for the ones that could extend beyond. We'll call it... What do you want to call it? I'm always bad with names. I don't know. Anybody have a name I can call it? It's uh I'll just I'll just write the name so it's coordinator properties that m might live longer than the coordinator. My challenge is to come up with a shorter version of that. Hmm. Well, while I'm thinking about that, let's document and say this contains the private properties of a coordinator. I should have just copied from here, shouldn't I? This um, that only live as long that live that don't live any longer than the coordinator class instance itself. And I guess we'll just say the opposite here, that may live longer. Okay. So, I believe we need to put the mutex in there. And we also want to put the unidentified private connections in there. Right? And I guess now, okay, we... Now let's let's let me think about what's a good name for this. I don't know. But once I one, the good thing is once I think of a name, I'll use I'll make that a pattern that I use for future structures of this kind. And I'm thinking about how did I name this in the past? I think I just made it the name relative to what's in it. But I kind of want, I, I'm thinking a better pattern would be anything that just lives longer. 
I'll be, I'm thinking back to how the difference between composition and aggregation, that when you aggregate something, the something is not a part of you, so it could live longer. So what if I call it at coordinator aggregate properties? And let, let me, uh, I like to do the right, to make the right call on names. So let me, let me go in my web browser here and look this up. So aggregates, your science. It, uh, yeah, aggregation is fine. Let me close that guy. And then do, do here we go. Object composition. Right, aggregation does not imply ownership. Composition owning object is destroyed, and so are the contained objects. Aggregation not necessarily true. So, what is the proper noun or adjective, actually? What is it actually called? I'm not seeing it, so maybe I'll just call it an aggregate. Aggregated? Aggregates. I'm, I'm just going to stick with this, and if someone corrects me later, then I'll rename it. So we're going to put it. Uh, let's put it near the top. So it's going to be a shared pointer because we share its like we share with any callbacks, any um, function objects that might also have it captured. We will share it like this. And let's make the name short so it's not so onerous to, because um, we're going to be typing it a lot. Uh, maybe that's short enough. We'll say uh, this holds any properties of the coordinator that might live longer than the coordinator itself uh, due to being captured in callbacks. And that's an example. I like to say EG for example. All right, so aggregates. So that means that it's in the aggregates here. And here, and here, and here. A couple places, isn't it? Ah, uh, but no, this is going to be different. So, so here we will capture the aggregates. So const auto aggregates. So uh, you can't you can't just do this. In fact, the compiler will just tell you right away you can't do that. So this is the pattern I use to do that, is you make a constant um, copy of it, and then you capture the copy. The copy, the original copy gets released, but it, the uh, captured copy sticks around as long as this function object is, and then we just simply remove the impl. And I might want to call it something different. Let's call it... coordinator. But essentially, it's the part of the coordinator that uh, part of the coordinator that we are um, holding a reference to, right? So this is good, because now, let's say the WebSocket lives longer than the coordinator. It kind of shares a reference to the aggregates that were in the coordinator, and it can continue to use them even if the coordinator is itself destroyed, so now we can safely remove this. And so it's shared between these callbacks and the coordinator itself. So it's it's safe and we don't have to worry about lifetime so much. We just need to put properties in the correct place. So things that might live longer than the coordinator need to go here. And things that I know for sure for sure will not live longer can go here. Which I think all of this is tr So some of this might move like we might need the configuration in a callback so it might move. It's okay if we move it later. All right, so now this is a little onerous because it's a nest, nested setting up of callbacks, so I might want to refactor this out. 
it's essentially saying set up a callback when we get a new connection. So later when we're called back, we're going to store the connection. And then we're going to, for the connection, we're going to tell the connection, hey, you call us back if this connection gets closed. So when later the connection does get closed, we go see, well, does the connection still exist? Okay, if it does, then remove it from any unidentified connections that might be. That's the only place where it could be. So later this might be moved, so we'll have to you know, try to remove it from everywhere it might be. Okay, but this right now should make our test pass, which is all I really care about right now. <laughs> no, I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? It should have said, oh, hold on. Hold on, I think I might know. We, in the in the test, we are calling the broken delegate. The pro thing is, is that ever set? It, okay, it should have been set. Oh, wait. Um, when, when does WebSocket set that? It might not get set until we tell it to open. Which should have happened when we called open. Yeah, I should have said it there. So what's going on? Oh, well, when, when in doubt, you can run it. So let's set it up to run. I don't know if I have this set up to run yet. Oh, I do. Uh, let me go see if it's set to run the correct way. But no arguments. Okay, good. So we're just going to run it and see what happens. Okay, what did it do? It stopped. Good. And where did it stop? Oh, stop. I had a breakpoint. Okay, remove that breakpoint. Continue. Oh, what happened? Okay, I've run into this problem before where I'm used to the debugger stopping in the, in the debugger whenever we get an unha unhandled exception. I don't know how... To, I switched to VS Code, and I don't know how to tell VS Code to do that. I wonder if it's the property here that we can tell. I don't know. No, I didn't see it there. So my alternative would be to set this up to run in Visual Studio. Yeah, I haven't done that in a while. Let's do that. So I actually have two different build folders. I actually haven't made this the one for this project, so we'll make it right now. So sort of an aside about how do you see make. So CMake is a build system builder. So it operates on a CMake list file, which if I just glance at it, looks like this. And it's sort of compiler tool set neutral instructions on uh, what we need a build system to do. And I won't go into the details, but what CMake does is it takes that file and a uh, generator that you tell it and uses that generator to make a build system. So if I say CMake, and we want to make a, a build system with a generator of Visual, Visual Studio, I need to spell it right, 2015, or was it 17, 2015? If, if not in doubt, we just do uh, help, I think, and it will tell us. This would be 15, 2017. And then I think I need to tell it x64 architecture and then the d path to where the CMake file, CMake list is. And it, it kind of figures out where my compiler is, where my tools are, which is a nice thing. And it will make a solution file for us. When it gets done, it's taking a little bit longer than I expect. Oh, probably one of the libraries I'm using has a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of this stuff. It's kind of like AutoMake, where in setting up the build system, it figures out what your OS and what your libraries that you have installed support. That's why it says looking for, checking for. It kind of customizes. If you have code that can be customized based off of what types, what sizes of integers you have, it, it does all that at, at build system construction time. So now, now anyway, we have a solution file, and I can just run that. 
And then the cool thing about Visual Studio is that it should just automatically stop on a breakpoint when uh, that exception happens in the test. If I could just figure out how to get that to work in VS Code, I'd be happy. Because with VS Visual Studio, I'm stuck with Windows. VS Code, I could move to Linux and still work, but yeah. So we need to set this as a startup project, and then we just build it, and then we just run it, and we'll see the uh, exception. Fortunately, my code isn't too huge that it takes a long time to build. Usually does it within a 20 to 30 seconds. You can do it, build system. Build that code. Okay. She's giving me a chance to rest my voice, I guess. Okay, there it's done. So we'll just go. What? What? Oh, I ran the wrong thing. Duh. Oh, WebSocket test I want. It's um, Realm Server test. Go. There we go. There's the exception. So, no pointer at that, so we go up. Oh, I know what it is. I never actually f made the aggregate structure in the first place. Okay, so... Don't need Visual Studio anymore because I think I know what the problem is. I made this thing, but I never initialized it. That was dumb. We should initialize it and make one. Here's an example where I can't use auto where I would like to. Um, let's, I'll show you what happens if I tried. Even with not it's just saying auto, it doesn't like auto, it doesn't like to do type deduction or variable declarations, even though it could be it could do it. Maybe a future version of C plus plus will handle that, but the one I'm on, which is eleven, does not. You might ask why I'm on C plus plus eleven and not fourteen or seventeen. The answer is I simply just haven't learned enough to be comfortable moving forward. I'm still learning stuff about C++11, like futures and async. I just learned last week. I've, I've programmed in C++ for a long time, but it was for, I don't know, 20 years. It was all C++98, only just recently updated. And I'm going to blame the company I worked for for not encouraging me to keep up to date with the latest stuff. It's not fair because they can't defend themselves, but... Should blame myself, but I don't know. All right, so running that test again, hopefully it does not crash this time. So go, I need to go to the correct build folder, run the test. Cool, passes now. Run all the tests. So we're, we're good to go. Good to go. Let's go back to, this, to the test and see what did we test. So they get dropped. When they're disconnected, that's good. So we're probably good to move on to identification. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to make a check-in. Use version control, namely git, but with a little tool I made on top of it because I like to separate my code into separate repositories for reuse. And um, this mugit is basically running git status on like all the repositories. If I did it with a... With an A in there, it'll like list them all. You can see how many repositories I have. It's kind of like Android's repo tool, or Google's repo tool for Android, where I have an XML file that lists all of these, and then it tells the tool where to go, and what, what branch I should be on, and all that stuff. So, all the tests are in my root repository, yeah. So another thing is, um, all of these components that are reusable, I've been trying to keep them open source with a very liberal license. I think I picked MIT. For the actual game, I want to keep that private so you won't find that in GitHub. 
Mostly because, you know, my my hope would be to one day, one day make this a commercial product, so. Um, not just not comfortable making it completely open source yet. It could always change my mind. Yes, yeah, so what do we do in in this check, in this commit? We... In the coordinator, accept private, accept and hold on to private web socket connections. That's all we're doing. One step at a time, right? We're not here. We haven't identified them. We haven't handled public ones. Just commit that and actually, so we've done private. Should we do public too? It might actually be incorrect, so we need to test it. So let, yeah, let's do that. So let's do both of these. And just repeat them here. And it will be new WebSocket from public. And we'll have another backdoor thing. Un get num unidentified public connections. And then what happens when a public connection is dropped when disconnected. We expect it to go back to zero. And then the difference between public and private is this flag. At least from the coordinator's point of view, the web gate will tell us it was true for private, false for public. And just to verify, let me go there and make sure. Is private. So it's true for the private ones, public, it's false. So one kind of weakness with C++, if you're familiar with language like uh, Python, is that um, when you look at the call here, you might not remember what the parameter's name or meaning is, and you kind of are forced to go look at the declarations to see what it means. It would be, it would be nice if C++ had something like this which other languages have. Unfortunately, it doesn't. So we just have to remember or look back in the documentation that that flag means it's false. One way I could maybe compromise is instead of using bool, I could make an enum with two values, private, public, and then you would see the word public there. Or another way, a an old, more old school way would be to use uh, pound de uh, if defs or pound, pound define, like pound define public connection uh, false, and then I could use it here. I don't like using these macros because they're easily abused. So this is right at the line where I might start to consider using a, a symbol like an enum, but not quite over that line, so. All right, so we need this public connections. We'll put it right next to the private one. And by the way, that size T is declared in a header called standard def. We should probably be a good citizen and include that where we actually need it. And you, you might notice I do mix C and C++. So size T is from C, which is why it's the dot H header. Some people don't like that. They're, they're, they're rather... I include C standard def, but I'm a little bit more f loose. I'll mix C and C++. I don't see the problem with it. I've never run into an issue with it. I figured that if something exists in C and C++ didn't really improve on it, you know, why, why use the C++ wrapper for it? Just go straight to the C. Okay, returns the number of WebSocket connections from unidentified public clients, e.g., Um, player, players, browser, players, multiple players, browsers. All right. I wish that the uh, plugin I use for VS Code would wrap this correctly, but watch what happens when I try. It's um needs wrapping like that. 
hit alt, uh, hit the key it does nothing it's confused i think by by that part so i have to manually do it the wrapping up here is done which is nice i just hit uh, the key binding I have for it, which is Alt-Q. Which is sort of a bad key bind. Alt-Q on the Mac actually quits the VS Code, which I've done a couple times already. But um, you can change your key bindings, but I have that bound, so it's easy for me to wrap that. Okay. Let's go to where this is de not declared, implemented. It doesn't know. Okay. Fine down here somewhere actually from here I need to figure out how to, I need to get to train myself to do this I think it's the control P no shift P no it's one of these um, go to none of these Go to symbol flush. Control Shift O. Okay. Control Shift O. I get there. I need to. I need to train myself. Control Shift O. Got it. Okay. There's where it goes. Okay. So it's gonna be pretty much the same as private. Only we're going to a different property, which we haven't defined yet, which is public. So let's make that one while we're at it. Actually, it's just going to be a, pretty much a copy of this, isn't it? I'm going to say with unknown. Uh, I didn't say private here. Private parties? Public parties? Players, browsers. Okay. That gets the number. Where do we actually push it in? Actually, th this is enough to compile and see that the test fails. I should remind, r remember to do that. Because we want to see, we want to see the test fail the first time at least. And then we will know that when we change, we change the code and make it go from Fail to pass that we're actually doing what we thought we were doing. So right, so right now it doesn't know that there was a public connection. So to make it know that it is, we need to use this is private, I believe. So yes, I think the right way to do it is here. If it's private, put into the private connections. Else, put into the public ones. Right? So that's one part of it. You could probably guess what the other part we need to do is. The other one is this when it's dropped. Is that the last one that was failing? No. Right, so we got the one that was failing was a new WebSocket from public. So that's passing now. Now the one that's failing is when it's dropped, it's not removed. Which is probably what if you're You've been following. Oh, hi, not Zane. I didn't notice your uh, messages. How long have I? It's been 10 minutes since I. I'm sorry. I am. Yeah, I should say not Zane. I, I'm switching to a Twitch client that doesn't uh, give me an audio cue, so I've been missing messages. I'm. I need to train myself to glance over more often. So to answer your question, Omnia Regna is Latin for all realms. It's just a name I thought was cool because the game I'm building, one of the core principles of the game is that you'll be traveling between different worlds and when you uh, travel from one world to another it'll be pretty drastic and that even the UI might change so that's the the origin of the name and using C style structs to pass parameters use designated initializers yeah that would be one way to I think you're talking about where I was passing false here right yeah that's one way I could do it that that's too much typing for me and I'm lazy. <laughs> but I understand. Like if I had a lot of parameters, I I definitely would do that. I've done that in a couple places. Like when I set up the websock web webgate. Right? Well, 
I use the JSON object, but it's the same principle. It's a, it's a structure, and I'm passing arguments through a structure so that I can show their names, right? Yeah, I apologize not saying that if you're still here. Forgive me for not seeing your chat right away. Uh, if you... If if it seems like I'm ignoring you, it's it's not you, it's me. And if you uh, you, you can always tag me in the message to get my attention, because that will that will make a little chirp sound, and I'll I'll know someone said something. Until then, I gotta keep training myself to look right there where my chat messages are. Oh, there you go. I I got that cue. Yes. So yeah, I'm switching to. A chat client called Yata that uh, someone in Adam's channel made and mostly because he's actively building stuff off of it and he's really receptive and nice guy so I was using chatty before Yata is built into the browser it's just missing some of the little things like the audio cue and um, he actually said he would add it which is really nice of him so that'll make things easier for me when he does okay so Right, we are not removing from the correct places. So we can kind of cheat here. We, I'm pretty sure something that begins as a private connection will never move to the public and vice versa. So we can just capture that flag, and do the same kind of thing in here. So if is private, remove it from the private connections, else remove it from the public connections, right? That'll probably be good. For a long time, if not forever. So let's do that. There we go. And let me remove the filter so we run all our tests. Cool. So I, I, I begin to feel I'm a little, getting a little bit of uh, extra stuff done. That was a horrible phrase. Let me start over. I feel like I'm accelerating on this project again after after the long break and not struggling so much. All right, so we are at checking in coordinator change. What did I, I'll just, I'll just take the last one and I'll repeat it, but put the word public instead. Cool. All right. So next thing was to identify the orchestrator. So this is where I'm going to need to be passing actual messages and then Probably just use a backdoor method to see uh, that the orchestrator has been identified. How do we know if it's identified? It's identified or not, so it's probably a Boolean state. So let's actually, before we do this, let's say no orchestrator identified at first. So at first meaning what? Probably that we do everything but connect as the orchestrator. So that would be a private connection like this and then we don't need an act we're just asserting that false that the coordinator will say is orchestrator identified all right so let's just get that test right out out of the way right right away that's a bool so how's it been going not saying I, I haven't uh i haven't streamed in a month so I miss you and other people that are in here. How's it going for you guys? Oh, hey, Adam. Adam, why'd you end early? I hope everything is going okay. Uh, how is the censored going today? Oh, no. What is that, six Adam nukes? Does that mean all six of your... You broke it? Oh, no. Oof. Everything's fine, but Circle CI is causing an error that you don't feel like working around, so you figured it in early. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, thank for the bit. Thank you for the bit. For the bit, Magic Viper. And hey, 85 filter. So, um, 
just to give you guys a little bit of a warning, I'm trying to use Yada, and so I'm not very good at following chat sometimes, and I'll miss messages. So if you say hi and I don't acknowledge it, it's probably my fault. And uh, if you want to make sure that I see a message, and please don't spam this too much, but um, just tag me in the message that there's a little audio cue. Yata is a Twitch chat client that you guys all know about, right? That uh, the Dio made. And thanks for the follows, guys. I should explain about what I'm doing. So I took about a month off. Before that, you can look at my notebook. There's a link below. Before that, I did about 70 streams building up web stuff. So if I... I go to, oh, where do I have it? Where did I put the thing? Not references, not log, notes, web server. So I built up uh, a bunch of components to make my own web server. I kind of reached a point after 70 streams that I'm like, okay, it's functional enough, but it, it, I need something fun to, to, to work on with it. So my idea was to make a game, because games are fun, right? So... It took about a month because I really needed to do research and learn enough about uh, the different parts of what I would need in a, in a game. Mostly the server side is interesting to me, so I'm focusing on that first. So I, I put together a bunch of, of ideas and came up with this. And, and actually, serendipitously, Adam helped uh, point me to the Raft consensus algorithm, which I'm, I'm planning to... Uh, heavily leverage if not use and uh but first before i go into the architecture what what is this game I'm calling it omnia regna which is latin for all realms and it's sort of a th the third or fourth iteration of a game and i don't really have a good overall diagram of it but i have this cornerstones so it's going to be an online game persistent as in that it never goes down uh it's fault tolerant you can always go go into it, even if I'm working on the game. And is that another bullet point? Okay, it doesn't have its own bullet point, but persistent to mean to me always uh, also means that it evolves over time. It won't go down for like content updates. I'll be actually in the game adding content as other people play it. And um, a lot of the detail here is going into stuff that relates to the. Uh, consensus stuff and making sure this the I can run multiple servers and they stay um, in agreement with each other but it's going to be multiplayer and sandbox which is because I really like sandbox games where you don't have invisible walls there's lots of different things you can do you could explore for secrets that I put in the game you could be trying to f defeat a difficult boss or grinding gear trying to put different different things in there to attract a, a wider audience RPG focused and the theme is I don't know if this will stick, but there's a classical like Ultima 3 comes to my mind. It's like something that I really enjoyed when I was younger, and I'm going to build off of that. But eh, there might be other things. The Alt Omnia Regna is Latin for all realms, so the, you might go through a doorway, and it changes into a sci-fi game. What's the timeline for this game? It sounds like it describes seven plus years worth of work. I've been working on the concept. So this is like the third or fourth iteration for lots of years. But... Um, I know watching Adam stream and others that generally a game would take at least two or three years. So I'm going to try to make the time frame along the same uh, by trying to keep things as simple as I can. I know that already with the uh, cornerstones I set down, it's going to be kind of, ch kind of challenging. So I, I don't know. I guess I'm shooting for what I really want with the knowledge that I might have to scale it back at some point. So hopefully it's not seven plus years, but uh, one, one thing I, I want to try to, to succeed at, which might help on the time scale, is the, do I have, I wish I had a bullet for it. Mm, I'll just talk about it. So I, I want it to be an evolving game. So I want it to start simple and so people can jump on it fairly early and then just be expanding what the game is over time. Sounds like the world in player one. I don't know player one, though. What language am I making it in? So did I describe that in today's thing? Oh, in the, in the panels down below, 
I have uh, questions in there, and I think it says on the server side, so all this stuff is going to be in C++ and Lua. So game object methods I want to script in Lua so that I can easily um, inject code while the servers are running and not have to take the servers down to re replace the code. On the client side, I'm, uh, I've been inspired by Adam and others to make the client in the browser and use something like pixie.js for the graphics. If you, can, if you guys remember Ultima 3, right? It was, let's see, for you guys it would be up here. You'd have this much, but this much of the UI was the world. And then over here, you'd have your, your list of players. And then down here, you'd have the, the dialogue. So think of that genre. And, uh, but uh, in the browser. So pixie.js sprang to mind as uh, something I could easily do the, all the, uh, the uh, world view and like the map and all that stuff using that. And then just use normal JavaScript probably something based off of React, because I've been inspired to use that for the rest of the UI. So hope that answers that question. So just looking into Phaser rather than trying Pixie? Okay. I actually was playing around with Pixie and I got uh, something working really quick, so that that uh, was it's encouraging. But I'll look at Phaser too. And am I enabling any UGC? I'm not sure what UGC is. Make it in Russian. You know, I'm open to be having it translated by other people. I don't know Russian, though. I need a f huge FAQ. Well, maybe eventually. Right now, it, I haven't even done anything yet, so there's not much to say. Stream Elements is helping me out there. There's a link to my notebook. And, oh, are you hearing the notification sound? Oh, I need to... That's a problem, isn't it? I didn't think about that. You know, for now, I'm just going to reduce in OBS the sound that my um, computer makes. I'll, ro I'll lower another 10 dB. Sorry about that. I'm used to chatty routing its audio elsewhere, but now I'm using Yada in browser, and the browser sounds are going through the main audio. Sorry, Endorn. Okay. User-generated content. That's a good thing. The freaky? I do want to enable that. I was talking to uh, my kids the other day that I could set up like little sub worlds or realms for either uh, supporters or my family or friends that they could actually make parts of the game themselves. Like they would be a local dungeon master, so to speak, and they'd be able to actually program in sub parts of the game. And you know, that might, that might, that might work if people are really into that, that would actually help me build the game and evolve it. And hey, maybe one of the realms that you go through, you end up in Botland. Who knows? Um, I just had this wacky idea that you might start in an Ultima 3 kind of UI and world, and you might go through one of those magic doorways, and poof, you're, n you're now in a sci-fi game. Now, how that would string together, like maybe you're some kind of special, your character or some kind of special, um, what is that? was a sci-fi show where someone would hop from world to world but uh, basically you you would be act you your character would be acting their the correct part to fit into the world that they're in but they'd be they'd be aware that that they're jumping from world to world so uh, sliders yeah so something like that we'll see Th these are all just like pie in the sky uh uh i don't know things to shoot for but um I probably won't even get anywhere near some of this stuff until I have a lot of this uh, architecture stuff set up and the and the back end set up. So it's going to be a while. Did I miss any other chat? Did I go back to code? I don't want to have people stare at my diagram too long. So, oh, I didn't mention how far I am along here. So. This web server took me 200 hours to make. That was the first 70 streams. I made a little front end to aggregate the fact that I have three instances of it, as this picture shows. I have pu pri private facing ports so the, the servers can uh, maintain consist consensus. I have public ports that clients can get to, and I have a well-known public port so that a client that doesn't know about the servers can discover them. So three of them means, uh, I 
needed sort of something to sort of aggregate them together to, to make the API simpler. I'm working on coordinator right now, and that is operating this web gate, getting WebSocket connections in from all over the place, and, and then probably doing the consensus stuff, but also passing along uh, conflicting log slash journal entries to something called the reconciler that figures out how to fit them together. I'm trying to separate the different parts of the server logic into units that I can easily test and build independently of each other. And it I don't want to rehash everything here, but just, just know I'm just starting. You can look at my notes. Ask me questions if you have any, but um, I, I just have this top row done and this second row I'm working on today. Probably won't get to this other stuff for a few weeks. So were there any questions while I explain that? Thank you for following, DeFreaky. No questions. Okay. So for those of you that haven't seen my code before, I like test-driven development. So I always start writing tests first. I use Google Test Framework. It lets me describe each use case as a test like this. And if you were to look into any one of these, like this is the simplest case, where we test that when we call configure with a configuration that we expect it to return true. A more involved example would be something like this, where I have broken up into three sections. First, we arrange the use case. Then we actually do the thing. Then we then we check to see if everything worked. And this is a good example because it's showing direct observation and side effect observation. So we arrange by configuring the coordinator. Then we tell it to do the thing, mobilize. To me, mobilize means it's going to become an active object that might have worker threads in the background, might be doing all kinds of crazy things. And I se like to separate that from construction and configuration. Uh, that's just how my mentor taught me. So here we're testing that when we mobilize it, we're giving it the web gate, telling it the name of the realm it's on, which instance number it is, that it's going to say good to go. And side effects will be that it um, binds the instance ports and the main port. It does not unbind them. And then we expect that the configuration it gave to the web gate matches what we expect. And you'll see this word mock here. That's a key word in test-driven development. The idea is that when you're just testing the coordinator, you don't want it to use the real web gate or the real reconciler. You want to fake those or mock them. So I have a mock web gate defined in the tests themselves. That's the connection. It's the web gate. So it implements the interface to a web gate in terms of just pretending to do the, the work. That way I don't have to have a real network connection. It kind of fakes all the network connections. And it's nice separation. So the all the web gate mock was doing in that case was it was storing the fact that certain methods were called and it stores the configuration it received. So we can just kind of look and see. Was it was it given what it should have been given? All right, now I'm going to catch up on chat. And thank you for following names should have a comment. That's um that's a default message that uh Dream Elements does, right? Can I change that? <laughs> it should be thank that ink. Well thanks for the follows guys. I I'm gonna make a note of that actually. I think I can fix it. It's a default thing in Stream Elements probably. But um I bet I could change it, right? So let's make go to today. Note, add comma to follow message. I, I do this when I'm streaming if I'm not going to immediately do something, but I don't want to forget. Well, the other thing was to look into, I'm going to scroll back and chat to what Adam told me. It was phaser. Phaser as alternative to pixie.js. Oh, I must have said something that sounded like what is it uh, on the iPhone? Not Alexa, but the other one, <laughs> Siri. Siri thought I was talking to it. Okay, anyway. So I have those notes down. Yeah, you guys can't activate my Siri, but I mean, I'm kind of curious. Is, is, does anyone have a collection of like false positive matches to Hey Siri? And it did just activate. 
One of them that I found is, which is really funny, is on uh, in World of Warcraft, when you're coordinating in a raid battle, some you'll be t telling everybody when there's phase transition. So it's like phase one, phase two, and I found that sometimes when I say phase three, my phone will activate and say, because and, phase three sounds like, hey Siri, sometimes when I say it. Oh, it didn't activate that time. It It's really it, in... Uh, unfortunate time for it to wake up and start beeping at me because when you get to phase three of the fight you gotta really focus on the battle <laughs> and i'm like i'll be focused on the battle and all of a sudden my phone is activating I'm like no no stop it phone anyway i'm getting distracted all right so where was i we i had just coded i had done this before mobilization demobilization just today i have it accepting websocket connections from the private and public ports. Okay, and now they're un they're unidentified at first, and I wanted to have some way of identifying the orchestrator. I didn't mention what the orchestrator was. You won't find this concept in the, what is it? Raft consensus algorithm. It's something extra I added, and uh, don't confuse it with Adam's orchestrator. My names don't quite match his. Um, probably the closest is, Realm server is kind of like a combination of Adam's orchestrator, account server, and a bunch of other things. It's I'm kind of shoving everything into there right now. I'll probably break it up later. Orchestrator for me is just some really simple system service that the OS keeps alive. Kind of if you use Linux, it would be System D. On the Mac, it would be Launch D. And all its job is is to make sure that the correct number of Realm servers are running. And if any of them stop responding, it kills them and then starts it up again. So um, the only reason it would connect to a Realm server is just to like ping it and see, are, well, are you, I know your process is still alive, but can you, can you actually talk? That's the only thing the orchestrator does. So these um, private connections could come from other Realm servers or they could come from the orchestrator. So when it connects, I need some way for the Realm server to, to, be, to figure out, am I talking to an orchestrator or another Realm? And since it's all in the private side, I, I feel I don't need to do authentication. I just need to do identification. So right now I'm working on after we mobilize and yeah, if there's, there's no orchestrator identified first, we should expect false. This being a backdoor method, we should expect false. But if the orchestrator identifies themselves, we want basically to, to get a true. So I'll do the assert first. Now, how is it? orchestrator identify themselves. I'm just going to keep it simple at first. And I'm going to say the way it does it is we're going to send a message to the connection that is a uh, data receipt delegate. And I got to figure out what, what are we going to actually send it? And maybe just to keep it simple at first, I'll just have it, if it sends a zero byte, right? Then zero means orchestrator. Later, I'm going to make this probably JSON or something more elaborate, but um, it's, it's nice to start simple and then expand as you need. Let me catch up on chat. And, oh, okay, Google. Okay, Google. Send Raimu all of my money. Does that work? No? <laughs> oh, Overseer, yeah, and Dorn. Um, so maybe this isn't so conflicting with the other names. Overseer. <laughs> Oh no, I'm losing respect. I'm wait a minute, downed? I thought it was I thought it was at seventy something. Eh, ninety plus is good, right? Um, yeah. So I think. Oh, I'm not. Sure, I can't remember. What it was is an overseer? You have multiple overseers that have consensus, so that's still part of this part of my diagram. An orchestrator, I guess you don't really have one of those. All right, so. Here's the test. We set up and do the connection, and then the pretend orchestrator sends its identification code, and we expect that the orchestrator is identified. So test-driven development process is you make sure it builds so it doesn't build because I declared this method and didn't actually um, implement it, I guess. But we, we want to see it minimally build but fail at first. Uh, where where did I declare it there? Did I not? Um, okay, I guess I didn't place it. Yeah, didn't place it. That's just bool coordinator 
const. Oh, thanks for following. Byvlade. Hope I say your, your names correctly. And gosh, I, I hope I get better at watching chat. I really appreciate Hideo if, he, if he's here. I really appreciate him uh, considering my, I, I opened a feature request that it, uh, I'd like to be able to turn on a, a, some kind of small little tone or just like a tick sound that I could like then grab my attention and look. So he was nice enough to uh, to say he'd uh, work on that at some point. Okay, so is minimally, we say false, not the orchestrator. Okay, so it builds, and then we're going to run it. And we say it failed, and I, I can focus on that test. You'll notice that I'm not as good as other streamers at um, optimizing my OS. I don't have a lot of... Uh, Shortcut setup, it's mostly just uh, bad habits I've developed over the years. I've never concentrated too much on shortcuts, but watching other streamers like Adam, I, I realized that I could be do, typing a lot faster and more efficiently. I need to get into that. So, any comments about you need to use more shortcuts are, are appropriate, and yes, I will try. Is it C++? Yes, it is. And hey there, Yumela. Thanks for following. This part C++. I'll be probably be working on C++ for a while. And when I get to the client side, it's going to be JavaScript. So at that point, I'm going to be like Monka S because I'm very new to JavaScript. And eh, that's okay. I'll learn. But for now, it's C++. The, all the server side stuff here. So I'm only on the second row here. This is all going to be C++ except for methods of game objects where I want Lua to make it easy to inject new code without stopping the server and rebuilding it and stuff. And this is C++ 11. For a long time, I worked at a company where it was all C++ 98, I guess. And only recently did I, did I realize that I, I should be keeping up with the times. And so I'm, I'm progressively learning stuff from C++ 11. And I feel like I'm comfortable with all of it all the stuff I care about. I'm going to move to 14, 17, what is it, 20 now that they're on, and hopefully catch up to everybody else. So yeah, if you see stuff in here that I could be doing better, it may or may not be some, it might may be something I don't know about, or it might be something that's only in C++ 17, and that's, it's good that you, you can always point that stuff out, but I might not take your suggestion right away because I'm on the C++ 11 in my comfort level right now. Future is PHP. Yeah, you, sh you should put that kappa because that's ridiculous. <laughs> How long do you develop till now? So this server thing took 200 something hours. I started in June. Professionally, I've been working for over 20 years, but it's in a, in a company where I wasn't really learning much. It was just doing the same thing, just maybe a little bit more quickly and learning Technology, not directly programming language, but more like, like I learned a lot of audio and video formats over the years. Um, so you've been doing it a long time, but not really learning as much as you might expect over that long period of time. So I'm, I feel like I'm now once again learning again, now that I've started a company to um, try to pursue this. I'm back to learning and it's difficult for me because you can't it, what's the say, saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks i feel like you can but the, that dog is very resistant and lazy so but i'm trying so hopefully i answered the question of how long i've been developing this 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 game stuff very new one month uh the web stuff about what was that five months and then in general before that a long time but older stuff just started to learn developing it's so huge and much languages. Learning while streaming is really difficult. That's true, but uh, there, it's, there's, a, there's a flip side to that. I get a lot of suggestions that I then will put down in my log here and learn about later, right? I already learned two of them just in the last hour. And when I'm done, when I, I feel like I'm exhausted actually working, oh, hey there, Blueberry King. See, the notification's working. And hopefully, was that too loud? 
Give me a what face if that was too loud. I can reduce it even more. It's down 20 dB though. But anyway, um, after I'm done, feel like I'm I'm done for the day uh, trying to do my own thing, I go watch all the death streamers and I get all sorts of ideas and I learn new things just watching them. So th I think there's a balance. It's difficult. It's true it's difficult while I'm streaming, but before and after streaming, just being engaged with the community, I'm learning a lot overall. It was lower than before. I didn't get any what faces, so uh, you can still hear it. I need to... I need to figure out how to route just one tab. You know, what? maybe what I'll do is I'll use a different browser and have that route through uh, a different audio interface so that you guys don't hear it at all. Let me put that in my notes. Uh, run Yata in a, in a different browser so I can route the audio differently. So viewers don't hear audio cues. All right. All right. So, yeah. So that was that was f still failing, right? Because I have not actually done anything with the data I've received. So, this is actually going to be a problem because before a lot of you came into the channel, I was musing on the fact that. This connection is going into a WebSocket, and that's the real deal WebSocket. It's not a mock. So it needs, it's expecting to receive bytes that match the actual WebSocket protocol. So this zero isn't going to fly. Um, what I really want to do is have something in the middle, have a mock connection go to a client side WebSocket, which then talks to this server side WebSocket. So that the WebSocket layer is just kind of transparent. But for now, maybe I'll just cheat and I will steal an actual WebSocket message from my tests of WebSocket. And it has to be a client form, so... Uh, let me collapse this and just find a client-side message that I can steal from. Send text, maybe? That's a server-side text. I need a client-side text. Ah, here we go. It's a little bit more elaborate because I have to mask it, but it's not too bad. We'll just, um, how do we do this? Okay, that's asserting. I need the other end. And you know what I need to do is I just need to search for mask. Probably find it that way. Here we go. Yeah, there's a little bit of masking you have to do if you are a sending a message as a client or receive this is where it's receiving a message as a server so instead of a zero zero let's arrange it here we'll have a mask we'll have the data being a zero zero the frames begins with that and i believe this is a length that's six it doesn't say it here but i believe so it would be a one we do that, and then now we can just send in the frame. And what does it want? I think it wants a vector. Yep, vector of u and date. So we will convert it. We will say standard vector of uh, u and date. And it's from frame. There's probably better ways to do this, but. This just says make a make a vector of u and eights form by traversing the frame string from using its begin and end iterators as bounds. So that if that that would that should come back out inside here as a message as a text message with just a zero byte. Actually, it's not a really legal. Yeah, let, let's let, let's just we can actually do this better. Let's say. Um, Boga hey, because why not? All right, I like Kit Boga. So we'll make the message seven bytes long. Boga hey, that will, that will be something the orchestrator says for now. No, the yeah orchestrator. So in order to receive a message, I need to add another set up another delegate, which I need to make this code even more ugly. I will need to refactor this soon. 
for now, we'll just set up a callback. So I, I like to call them delegates because that's what they're called in C-sharp. And let me catch up in chat a little bit. Stream is pretty quiet. Okay. Okay. There was a boga hay from playing with scissors. So yeah, so text delegate. This is a callback when it receives a text message over the WebSocket, and it's going to be... Okay, it's pretty simple. It's just the data as a string. So, like that. All right. So, let's just code what we need, and we'll capture what we need. So, what do I... I'm going to want to make it a thread-safe thing, because we don't know the thread context... The WebSocket calls us back on. I think what we'll do... Okay, we need to capture coordinator. I think what we'll do is we will just accept if anyone says boga hey, and then I'll make more unit tests to refine it so that we don't allow something public to, to call itself the, co the uh, orchestrator. Industry standard is setting infra hello. Yeah, but Boga Hey is much more cool, isn't it? I, let me make a note of that. Because I actually kind of like, I like memes, so. Uh, let me just copy that. I'm going to use this cool feature in Yada where I can double-click his message and paste it here. Oh, that didn't work. I think because chat moved when that happened. There we go. Uh, I hate this. The one note for Windows 10, I can't make the default keep text only. I want to do that and oh well. Adam started it now come your your company does it too. Well, I will do it too and we will make it an industry standard. How about that? And in fact, maybe I'll do it right now because why not? That's not that long of a string. Only difficult thing is it's got a uh, uh, double quotes in it. So sorry, sorry, Bo Kit Boga fans, but I'm gonna take out the Boga Hey and instead say infra hello. Uh, we need to count that though. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, ten, eleven, twelve. All right. Okay. So if data equals infra hello. And hey, guess what? Orchestrator identified equals true. I'm just, it's going to be just dumb right now and not what we actually want to do until I make unit tests to kind of force me into doing the right thing. It's a step by step process. So we will just return that and make it a flag, oh, it's in our aggregates. Make it a flag in our aggregates. Here. That starts out as false. And we'll say, I, okay, the first shortcut I'm gonna make for myself is make that, so I don't have to keep fumbling with it. I wanted to make that. So for the first thing I'm going to do with shortcuts when I get around to doing it is to make that a shortcut. Okay, so this flag indicates whether or not um, the orchestrator has been identified as... Actually, you know, I'm going to do a little bit better here. Because I'm looking at this thinking, you know, why don't we just put it here as orchestrator? and say, um, this is the connection to the orchestrator. If it has connected to us. It, if we have a connection to it. Have an identified connection to it. If we have, sorry, I talk, I'm talking what I'm thinking, I really shouldn't. Have, if, it's identified itself. If it's connected and identified itself. There we go. All right. Catching up on chat a little bit. Yes, we are a cult. Infra hello. Infra hello. Actually, you know what? I could make that a uh, 
emote in my channel if I ever go anywhere with the channel. Oh, thanks for the bits, Blueberry King. That's really nice of you. That was only a minute ago. I don't feel so bad that I missed it as it happened. Actually, there's another idea for Hideo that um, add a tone for if there is a uh, cheer. I don't know if there's a... There's not one for a follow either. Like tones for if there's a, a chat, a, a channel events, like cheers, follows, subs, that kind of thing. That would be nice to see. You don't understand, but you're glued to watching this. Sorry. Um, you can tell I'm a little bit rusty, and even before, when I wasn't rusty, I was pretty new at streaming. Um, I'm open to suggestions, though. If you If you tell me that, you know, you're talking too much, you need to code more, code slower, faster, let me know. I'm trying to get comfortable in this because that to me is a key to being productive and motivated to do it, is to uh, move from a solo development setting where I'm listening to music only to where I have streaming, I'm getting input from the community, but I still feel comfortable that I can, I can sit and code and um, it's not a stressful thing. I'm trying to get there. Okay, so yes, we don't need a silly flag. We will just say it. We return that it's not equal to null pointer. All right, and then we can do a clever thing here. We can say it equals the web server, and we should actually remove it from the unidentified private connections, shouldn't we? Aha, but maybe it didn't come in on a private. Well, let's just assume it did, and we'll make a test to uh, that will fail at first. That um. We can make sure, because this will allow it to come in from a pub public connection, which is really bad. We'll make a test to, to correct that. So we're going to need the WebSocket, which means we need to capture the weak pointer and recover it. And, you know, did I explain this to people watching now? I don't remember. When you capture things in a callback, you want to make sure that you're not creating a circular reference. So if I passed the, a strong reference to the WebSocket back to the WebSocket through a delegate, it would be bad. So instead, I, I make a weak pointer to it, which doesn't count towards the reference count immediately. It's when you try to lock it, if it still exists, its reference count is one or more, it'll actually give you a strong reference that'll last the whole call. Um, so it avoids the circular reference, but it allows us to get back to the object. So that's why I have a weak pointer. So weak pointer lets us ir remove it from the unidentified connections and set it as the coordinator. Another test I just thought of is if the coordinator disconnects, we need to uh, release that handle. Before I forget, let me make empty tests for these things. So, one is that Orcus um, public clients should, uh, should not be able to identify themselves as coordinators. It's perfectly fine to make absurdly long function names if they're tests because what you want people to be doing in your test suite is looking at it like this and then reading these almost like they're, they're words. In fact, you might want to put underscores in here to make it even more readable. I, I don't, but you could. And um, you want them to be ridiculous, ridiculously long if it helps them figure out what the test case or the unit or what the uh, use case is. All right, so that's one. What's the other one? Uh, coordinators, when they disconnect, this coordinator, oh, it's not coordinator, right? It's uh, orchestrator. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess someone in chat already just pointed that out. Let's see. No. You didn't, you didn't tell me I got it wrong? That's fine. Uh, are you guys playing with colors? Playing with scissors is pink again, but he didn't say the magic word. So I'm not going to recognize the playing with scissors color as, as being a, a good thing. Got to say the magic word with that color, playing with scissors. Okay, orchestrator uh, should, should be released if, if, it dis if it disconnects. Those are the two that I thought of. Uh, is that it? 
probably it for now. So I'll leave them, I'll leave them empty and fill them in later. I just don't want to forget. Okay, so I want to, I want to get this thing working. That's what I'm mainly concerned about right now. Let's see, should that be it? We receive that string. It puts, it moves the WebSocket there, and then that it should come back as it's there when we ask it, right? Okay, so let's try that out. Trying to listen to the English class and the stream at the same time. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't have it on speaker. Otherwise, the people in your class would be like, so what's that noise? Or maybe you're not physically at your English class and you're you're online for both, which I, then I, I truly admire your ability to watch two things at once remotely because I can't do that. I tr actually got into this situation yesterday where I was watching Adam's stream, but I wanted to keep an eye on Mike's stream because I had just play tested his game and people were coming in and uh, talking about it. I'm like, I don't want to lose the chat, but I also want to watch Adam. I'm like, I, I can't watch two chats at once. It was, a, it was a disaster. Physically at class. Okay. Well, that's not so impressive, but still impressive. Next time, try to, to uh, listen to two things online at the same time. I can't do it. Okay. The test is failing still. Did I run it? I didn't run it. That's why. It's actually passing. Yay! I don't like things passing right away, though. So what I, sometimes I'll do this sanity check. So this is maybe a good thing to show if you're learning test-driven development. If things pass too much, it's not always a good thing. Sometimes it could mean that your test isn't actually testing the right thing. So one way is to sabotage it. Just It's easy to sabotage something. You just flick, flip one character, right? So... Now it should fail because the check, the idea is we want to foil the check down here, right? And it, it foiled it, which is great. It's just testing to make sure that it didn't get recognized as an orchestrator simply because it said something. It had to say this exact thing. All right, good. Um, let's make it a little bit more fancy, just because I feel like it. We know that this is a JSON string. I happen to have a JSON class. So, hey, you know what we can do? We can say, const auto data as JSON equals JSON object. Or no, I have it as parse, right? Par, uh, what do I have it? Value from encoding. That's what I named it. And then give it data. And then we'll say if data as JSON and then index infra, if it equals hello, then we can do that. And so I have a little bit of type mismatch. Will it? I think it will promote it correctly. Let's see if it works. Probably won't work. It did work. Let me sabotage it to make sure it really did the right thing. Let me sabotage it another way. Now it should show up in the JSON, but with the wrong value. Cool. So, great. So it's a little bit more fancy now. It's actually um, handled as JSON completely in the server. Great. Cool. Catching up on chat again. All right. The chat volumes died down a little bit, but again, if you're just uh, joining in, wondering what I'm doing, please ask. And if I don't respond to chat immediately, you can tag me, because I'm I'm still being trained to um, keep up with chat. I'm really bad at following it sometimes, and I don't mean to uh, uh, disappoint people by them feeling that they're ignored. So please speak up and feel free to tag me if I don't respond right away. I feel like this is a good check-in point. And I apologize for the horrible thing, but I'm just so used to... Oh, I never filled it in. I'm so used to using Git GUI to make co commits that, you know, it's been hard to adjust. Where was that? In the header file? Okay. Well, 
I must have gotten distracted and forgot to finish my sentence here. Uh, this method returns an indication whether or not uh, the orchestrator has connected and identified itself. And then I'm going to sort of repeat the same language, but in the context of its return value. Like indicating whether or not is returned. And again, I, 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 it's a little bit redundant, but the idea is that a documentation parser might put this paragraph and this paragraph in different sections of the documentation. And I want the user to know what the re function's return value means, no matter which landing place they ended up on. That's why I do that. All right, uh, that was, should not have affected anything. The run and test anyway, though. Let's run without the filter, actually. I should have done that before I even started the commit. Okay, we're good. Oh, two, web, two cases because it thinks of the WebGate tests and the coordinator test as being different cases. I don't like the fact that it uses the word cases. I think it should be suites, but Google likes to call them cases. Um, check in, check in time. Yes, there is the new API I needed. There's the storage for the orchestrator pointer. There's how we figure out it's connected. That's how we identify it. This is how we test that it's not identified first. It is identified once it sends the right message. And then we have placeholders. I think I will keep these off of the... Actually, the way I'd like to do this is stage it all first and then select those lines and unstage them. And unstage that line. Because these are placeholders. So this commit is coordinator. I played around with making this dark theme, but I, I just couldn't get it to work completely, so I gave up. And I've tried other GUIs for making com commits, and I just haven't been happy with any of them. I tried GitHub for desktop, I tried SourceTree on Windows, and I tried Tortoise, Git, and... I mean, they're all, they're all pretty nice, but i just not gotten comfortable with any of them. Just so used to this uh, GUI. All right, coordinator. Recog uh, identify, re uh, recognize, orchestrator, note, identification method is subject to change. So I'm going to remind myself that I'm not done. Maybe I should put a note in the source code too. Note, this is subject to change. Although, it is pretty cool to have that uh, meme. Not the best in your, in your opinion, but might just be nicest for me. Uh, have I tried the built-in VSC one? Oh, I have a problem with the built-in VSC one. Actually, it wouldn't be a problem here. Oh, let me show you the problem after I check this in. All right. I want that line. Okay, so we're just going to commit that. I'll show you the problem. So it works fine if the whole directory tree is managed by one Git repository, because if I go here, I see the, the one thing, and I could type it in here. One problem I do have here is that it doesn't tell me the 80 character limit. I think maybe Adam mentioned that in his stream too. I'd like to keep this to 80 characters, and I don't have any kind of guide to know how much I've typed, but I could use that. The problem I have is if, since I have a multi-repository workspace, if I go into a library that's pulled in from a different repository. Let's say it's a uh, JSON or something like that. And I make it make some kind of change. Check it out. It doesn't see the change. And I don't know how to tell it to look at that repository. The closest I found is if I you go to git lens, it figures out that the um, file has uncommitted changes here, right? But I don't know how to, how do you commit with git lens? I don't know. I could I couldn't figure that out. So if anyone could figure out how how do I ma how do I make a commit from either this file history or from another way is if I find the repository here and I go I can go here, but there's no button that I could find to make a commit, and then the VSCS it doesn't it's not in the correct repository, 
The infuriating thing is it tells you somewhere what the active repository is, but I think that's just for Git lens. Let's see if someone's giving me an answer. Git .input validation always. You do it from the build in the terminal. Eli for one. Uh, bot landy. It does tell you when you're over the character limit, but yeah, it'd be nice to have it visible. Oh, it does tell you? Let me see this. At some point, will it warn me that I'm over? It's not warning me yet. Oh, I had to stop typing. That's actually, I would actually go with that. Okay, so I'll take back my uh, objection about the line limit. The other problem I have with this, though, is I can only type one line. If I type enter, I think it actually makes the commit. Oh, no, it's control enter. I c oh, never mind. Okay, I take back that almost objection I almost made. So, okay, I'd be okay with this. The problem is it doesn't work with the multi-git repository. I can't, I can't get it to show the workspace of that sub-repository. Richard Haimu. Yeah, I kind of gave up on hiding my uh, name because the same reason I guess other streamers have but when, on my notebook. Uh, there's my name up here and I don't know how to hide it. Uh, it's ac actually more important um, to me to hide it in the public links I give out. I couldn't figure out how to do it. And it also shows up in the in the commits, right? I, I could... Oh, where does that show up? Right here, if you see... Um, Okay, you can't really, it doesn't show it, I guess, here. Okay, sometimes it shows the email address attached to the commit. And so it shows up there, you know, it's okay. It's, um, I have at least one layer of protection in that I have it filtered through. You don't see my actual email box. It's just a company, a company email forward. So I can always filter and redirect it or shut it off if it becomes a problem. Okay, what else did I miss? Yo, RuneScape Maniac 2. I don't remember seeing you uh, in any other channel, so, but help, uh, welcome. The multi -repo, repo works out of the box for you. Okay, so Hideo, one difference is that I do not use Git sub module. I'm a weirdo in that I do what Google at least used to do, if not they currently do, is I have a manifest file. It looks like this. And it lists my repositories. And the reason I do this and not get submodule is I don't want to constantly make commits in the parent repo when I make commits in the sub repos, which you have to do with git submodule as far as I know, because what's checked into the main repo is a commit hash code. I, w I would like, if, this, if git submodule did this, I would switch back to it, but I would want the main repo to reference the sub repos by branch, not commit. Um, but if, if it can do that now, that'd be cool. So I made, I basically did what Google did and I made my own tool, which uses this metadata file to, um, to keep track of sub repos. And so of course, v VS code doesn't understand that they are sub repos. It just, I think it's just ignoring them. Um, Android studio notably, um, does the right thing in my opinion, in that it will see the sub repos, even if they're not sub modules it will still show them in their equivalent of this and it'll actually show like more like git lens and it'll have like a, like a combination of what you see in git lens and what you see uh, with the source control where you can have you can see the individual changes in e in each of the uh, repos and there's a mode where like it'll actually show them like the history shows it like this only um with the repo name in front and it's all collated and sorted by time, which is really awesome. But yeah, maybe I've, I've talked enough about Git for now. Andrew Gower made RuneScape and he's now making a new MMORPG. That, uh, well, I'm, I'm really new to the game making scene, so I probably don't know him. I don't recognize the name, but uh, I've been meeting people a lot recently, so maybe I will meet this guy. Oh, was leftist doxed? <laughs> Are you?
Are you Adam Gower, leftist? All right. I, I hope I didn't miss anything. Uh, okay. Back to what I was doing. All right. I made the commit. Let me remove that. Testing. So yeah, Hideo, I hope that explains why it might work for you and not for me if you're doing submodules and I'm not. That's my guess is why it doesn't work so well for me. All right, back to this test. I think I'm going to fill in this next. I got to keep an eye on time, though. I don't want to go too long. It's going to get noisy when my kids come home, so I probably want to wrap up before then. I'm working myself into streaming longer, but I'm still, for me, the the boundaries between three and four hours and that my voice just loses it because I just talk too much. I don't have any boga tea with me to soothe my throat. Okay, public clients. Right, okay, so let's construct the use case here. Sort of, It's sort of fun to construct use cases sometimes because you're, you kind of are like the uh, hacker where you uh, Adam hack, right? So I'm constructing uh, a way to hack in, and then I'm going to see that it's able to get in, and then I'm going to fix the code to block it. So how do we get in is we are going to connect to the public port. So that's indicated with this flag, right? That it's not private anymore. And then we're going to we're going to say, hey, we are the orchestrator. Even though we're, we're coming in from a public port, we're going to expect it's not identified. It shouldn't be, right? Problem is now it will be because we, we don't have that check in place. Right, so if I run it, it's fa gonna fail. Right? So it's actually identified as the orchestrator even though it shouldn't have been. But it's not too hard to fix, right? All we need to do is capture the fact that it's private or not. And we say, And not private, or and it is private, right? Actually, we could probably just do that first. We don't even have to, we don't even have to look at the data if it's not private. For now, that should be enough to fix the problem. There we go. So um, now that I'm the streamer, uh, I will abuse my privilege a little bit to uh, talk about. A silly little thing. I have a weird sense of humor. So when Adam raises or lowers his desk, I like to type in Adam transform. In the, for, for a while, it was just a secret hope that someone would catch up on it and say, you know, that, that ought to be an emote. But I don't think it was catching on, so I, f I figured I'd just uh, to announce it. And I give up my hope that it ever will be a real emote, but um, it's just a funny joke for myself. I always get a chuckle when... The desk goes up and down, and I just envision that there's an emote that people start spamming whenever it goes up or down. I don't know. My weird sense of humor. All right. So now we will not let public clients be orchestrators, which is good. Now the orchestrator should be released if it disconnects. Fine. So let us construct the case where we know it's an orchestrator. That is the setup. So the all the stuff to identify becomes part of the range. The act is that the uh, disconnect happens. So that, again, that's, we go to the connection and we tell it, we call back the broken delegate and we say it's not a clean exit, so disconnect immediately. And the answer should be that it's no longer identified. Also, we can put in a further check in there. I know we should have put in a, this check in the other cases too. The, that once it's identified, the number of identified ones should be zero. Right? Should be zero there. Um, that's not applicable. Right, so here, it's not identified, and also there are no unidentified. So it was identified and now is disconnected. It can't be found either identified or not. So this, of course, is going to fail at first. Guys, guys getting tired of my test driven development yet? I kind of rattle on about the process too much sometimes. Right, so it's the problem is it's still held on to even though it's been broken. And that's because we never let it go. In the broken delegate, or closed delegate here, we um, 
we removed it if it was unidentified, but we didn't remove it if it was the coordinator. So cool thing is that the uh, shared pointers sort of also double as uh, identity for objects. So we can say if the WebSocket equals the uh, coordinator orchestrator, then we can remove it. You know, also, I'm just noticing this. When something returns something, but I don't use the return value, like erase returns something, to, I, I like to do cast to void just as a, a note to anyone reading the code that I, I, I know about the return value and I didn't forget about it, but I purposefully don't care what the return value is. I don't care if erase return 0 or 1 or something else. It's uh, opting in. No, not opting in. It's like a like a a statement. If someone, if I read back my code and I don't see that, I'm like, oh, did I forget about the return value? Here, I'm like, I I know there is one, and I'm for, I'm deciding not to use it. Okay, so we just drop it at that point. Oh, and that does not have a return value. Cool. So let's see if that that fixes it. Great. Cool. Benefits end November 29 in two days. Whoa, I missed a lot of chat. Hold on. Hey there, Sourcefy. How's it going? Oh, you know what I should do? I don't need mods yet, but I should kind of recognize the people that... Uh, I don't know, I feel like you guys are my friends in the sense of the Twitch community, so why don't I why don't I take a moment to do this? Is this gonna work? I don't know if that worked. Type something, uh hold on. Type something playing with scissors. There you go. It worked. It it didn't give uh, Yada didn't give me any feedback when I did it. Okay, I recognize Blueberry King. Well, source of fire. Oop. Didn't mean to do that. How do you un VIP someone? I'll figure it out later. You guys are important to me, so let me know if I left you out and you're from regular Adam chat, and I will um, add you in just. I think I think it's a nice little thing. Badges are nice, right? Why not? Hopefully I got everyone who um is here that I know from Adam's channel. Oh, there's Pawn. Oh, wrong, wrong one. I misspelled it. There we go. Oh, and thanks for the bits playing with scissors. I missed that earlier. I'm just scrolling back in chat and seeing stuff I missed. Okay, let me scroll forward. What are you guys talking about? Oh, I, I know you. Metal Storm. Stream elements, though, not a very important person. Thirty years later, typing on my keyboard. I'm just for a cackle, maniacally. <laughs> exactly. I think, I think Adam understands my uh, weird sense of humor. People don't say it, but I know that they're thinking it. That you know, don't quit your day job. Don't don't become a comedian. Yes, you are all sapphire, encrusted people now. I never thought of it. I thought it was as a purple diamond, but I guess sapphire is a good uh, good analogy. All right, enough Twitch fun. Where where am I here? I got it to pass, but I didn't check it in. Let's do that. So the test change, it's nice to see what we actually did because it's elaborating. Let's split this up. It elaborates. Elaborate isn't the right word. It sort of gives you, if you look at the test change, it sort of tells you what use case I, I supported or what bug I fixed. Okay, so I did two things. Let me split this up. So first just this line this is just um filling filling in something that was missing coordinator tests um 
double check connection count. Yeah, it's en enough said. It's a one liner. Public ones can't identify it. Right, so let's split this up to. Let's stage all this. Did I, uh, did I spur some chat? Because it's getting a little bit more active. Oh, you're going? See you later, Adam. Bye. So I, I hope you feel better about the... I'll, I'll just go and say the, the naughty word, the DevOps. I think you actually are making progress, but I, I understand the hitting your head against the wall thing and uh, taking longer than you expected, but I, 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 just, I really do think that there's only a few obstacles left and you'll get through it and you'll be like, oh, that wasn't so bad, but I don't know. But take care. Hope to see you tomorrow. Ho hopefully your stream goes well tomorrow. And I hope you heard me before you left. Hope I didn't miss you. Okay. This test should not be able to identify themselves. So the code that goes with that uh, was this Yeah, this hunk. Right? Yes. Okay, so this this was all about coordinator don't let public clients become orchestrators. Seems like a seems like a reasonable thing, right? Okay, then this one was all about uh hold on, what's this? I think I screwed up in the last commit. Hold on. That was a test. I did screw up, so I need to amend. And I need to include these lines. Yes. Good. I like, I like amend. I can fix my mistakes very easily. So this one was, yeah, release the orchestrator if it disconnects. Got it. Release orchestrator if it disconnects. Oh, cool, you did see it. I know you won't hear the response to this one. That's fine. I need to I need to do some more walking actually. Adam's mentioning the gym. I don't I don't I'm not the kind of person who would go to the gym a lot, but I do think I need to get up and move more and walking. I think my dog and I would both appreciate it. I need to do that after the stream probably. As as coders and as streamers too are kind of apt to become sedentary, right? It's kind of up to us to to get up and move every once in a while. Yeah, my dog is uh in low energy mode now. Uh oh, what is this? Why is it using TLS? We one dot maybe. Mm. That's the first time I've seen that message today. I wonder if they just, if it's just because it's the first push I did today, or if maybe I just didn't notice it before. I need to look into that. That's probably because I need to update my um, uh, Git, what is it? MinGW Git, getting warnings from Bitbucket about TLS. Uh, look into updating Git. Uh, have I always committed to be a GUI and not push? I usually push from CLI. I don't like to push from the GUI because it opens another window and I, it always opens it on the wrong screen and it's annoying. So I usually push from the command line. But I, it's the first time I've noticed that message. Wondering if they just enabled it recently. Uh, MinGW git. Probably I have an old MinGW git that's using an old uh, SSL, right? Yeah, anyway. Hmm. I'm out of test cases. I need to think of what's next. What's my plan say? Oh, what did I do? I op I closed my OneNote. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, back up. Weird, I closed the wrong one too. 
Okay. Plan. Plan, plan, plan. It does accept them now. Have them connect to other realm servers if not okay. So maybe we'll do that next. See, the idea is that eventually this will support raft consensus algorithm, but for now, I'm just going to keep it simple. Go back in the diagram for... Oh, no. It's easier to show you in the config file. So in the config file, we have different server instances for a realm. And they could be on different hosts, but within, let's say, one host, the orchestrator's one and only big job is it's going to launch an instance of the realm server for every entry in this server list. So we'll end up having two instances. They, the both instances get a copy of the config file, so they sh they, they'll know which instance they are because they're told which one, and they'll know which other instances should be out there. <coughs> I have to get water. Oh, actually, I have water here. So let's say you're instance zero. You'll bind these two ports, and then you'll want to connect to these two ports to, in order to start negotiating with your... Uh, your peers, right? Yeah, Adam, I, you might have missed that earlier, but Adam keyed me into the raft consensus algorithm as a way to um, get uh, my uh, server data replicated correctly and uh, consistently. So I'll be doing that later. I still need to uh, read more and understand it better. But for now, we'll keep it simple. What we'll do is every instance, say your instance zero, it'll just try to connect to instance one and vice versa, and probably they'll receive multiple connections. And what I'll do is it'll just be first come, first serve. The second connection will just drop immediately. Adam bot, yeah, uh, Adam bottle. I need an Adam bottle. Right now I have a, a, a Raimu glass. Not as cool as an Adam bottle. And also my coaster's way over there. <laughs> so we're going to keep it simple. We'll just, I think I even had this in the config in the test um in the test configuration i think i had two instances right yeah same thing so we'll what we'll do is we'll start we'll do, okay it's, it's different things let's say your instance zero one use case is that instance zero should try to connect to instance one another use case would be that if it's already connected and it receives a connection back it should drop it right and then probably maybe another use case yeah it would be if the connection drops it should uh then try to reconnect again and maybe even a expansion on that is it, the reconnection should be it should try it should keep retrying i think that's part of the raft consensus algorithm that you retry indefinitely to uh send your uh, if you're the leader especially to resend the the um the log they say and the, or if not if you don't need to send it at least the heartbeat even if they disconnect you just keep retrying to connect so actually one difficult thing would be the connecting thing is a little bit more difficult than receiving a connection so this might be a little bit more work here let's let's set up the use cases at least so use case one uh, connect, uh, connect to other instance. That's one. <coughs> Start to cough if my voice gives out. And it, what is it? It's two hours, 43 minutes. So that makes sense. Starting to lose my voice already. Hi, what lib am I doing for JSON? Thank you for asking that. I made my own lib. If you're interested, I did it. Let me find it. I did it in streams 21 through 23, which are all on YouTube if you really want to see it. But I made my own JSON library here. I'll show you what it looks like. It's not too, it's not too difficult to make your own JSON library. So you, you, ha you recognize the different types of JSON values, right? And you can construct them from the different C++ types. And you should be able to compare them and cast them back to their C++ types. You should be able to get what type it is. If it's an array, it has a size. If it's an object, it has keys and values. You can get those keys. You can index by keys. If it's an array, you can index by integer. Actually, that, that these are both in array indexes. This one's the uh, object indexing. So 
if if I show you the code, it's really not that big a deal. Uh, the most complicated stuff is the parsing, I would say, but um, where's where's the easy stuff? Yeah, the construction is really easy. You just set, you just remember the type, and then uh, I just made a union. That's you use the one that matches the type. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in, in more of this stuff with the JSON, it's in those streams 21 through 23. But uh, one thing, one thing about my stream and about me, uh, I really like to get into the real low-level details of things. So if it's something approachable like JSON, I'm more apt to do it myself, even if there are stuff already out there to do it, because I, I get to learn a lot better. It's, it's fun, and um, I get to leverage it and say that, hey, it's something I wrote. Um, an example of something that, like if you asked, um, what lib am I using for SSL or TLS? I did not do that because it's uh, way beyond my ability to do encryption correctly. So I use Libra SSL, so you can see that being pulled in here. But so yeah, stuff like JSON, HTTP, hash functions, uh, base64 encoding, and even the AWS APIs, I've been doing it from scratch in C++. And all of these components are in my GitHub, and they're public, and you can take a look at the code. I think there's a link to my GitHub down below, but it's just github slash, uh, dot com slash rhymo8354. All the things that are low level are all uh, open source and available to everyone. The stuff inside of my game, though, I'm keeping it to myself for now. So yeah, hopefully I answered that question about JSON. I, I tried to make the JSON stuff or was it an example of it? As as close to natural code as I could. So you can do things like this. You can manipulate a JSON object and index it and then do a compare and then it just handled everything for you. Try to do that as much as I could. Thanks for the follow, Creative Knight. Okay. So orchestrator should be released. Okay, yeah, we already did that one. Connect to other instance. Another one would be drop redundant. Or actually, um, before we drop the redundant, we should accept accept connection from. Maybe we'll do that first because that's easy. Because we can fake it. Connect it to another instance, that's a little bit more difficult because we have to actually make like establish a new web socket not just get one handed to us so drop redundant um, instance connections so we are we're already connected to them but because of the race in establishing them they've tried to connect to us and it's like okay well i'm already talking to you on, on a we don't need b anymore well thanks for following Woos. drop redundant instance connections what else There was some other thing. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was a drop instance, dropped it, um, not drop, drop, yeah, dro it is drop. Drop disconnected instance connections. So we're connected to them and then they break the connection. We should drop it and then, this is really, there's two very related but different use cases here we might there's the initial connection there's also the reconnect if we've broken the connection so maybe I put it next to it the so reconnect to other instance so that implies that we are already connected and then we'll probably be wanting to wait a certain interval of time actually there's a, even a third case reconnect a first reconnect attempt to other instance, and then there's a second reconnect inst attempt. And we should say we should break this into succeed and fails. Second attempt to reconnect. I actually don't really care, do I? Eh, maybe I'll maybe I'll do it. Might be a little bit of overlap between these test cases, but that's fine. I want to, in the in these uh, second attempts, first attempts things. I'm I'm trying to capture a part of the use case, which is that 
it shouldn't be too rapid. If it fails, it should wait a bit before retrying. And then later when we do raft consensus algorithm, we're going to want to test that the timeout, like the time between it disconnecting or receiving the last message or whatever, uh, and then the attempt to reconnect, that it's a random amount of time um, because that's important to the algorithm. Gosh, I need more water. Pardon me. All right. I don't think I'm going to get through all these test cases today. Because actually, for one thing, I, I haven't eaten lunch yet. And my voice is going. So let me let me try to plan ahead of what I'll do now. Maybe I'll, I'll be a little bit conservative and say I'm just going to handle these two. And then we'll leave these for another day. So fair warning that... Uh, once I get to this point, this is going to be future stream. Your streams. Hopefully I can do all this in one stream. But we'll we'll handle oh I already did handle this. So it's just one. Yeah, see so these all I can do this one. I can do, I'll do these. These are easier. I'm trying to group together the ones that are quick and easy to do. These ones are more difficult because making a new WebSocket is a little bit more work than just being handed one. I think I mentioned that a little bit ago. Okay, accept a connection from another instance. I think that's a lot like the uh, orchestrator identified, only they identified themselves somewhat differently. Actually, you know what, guys? I need a, a one-minute break. So let me see if I set this up right. Do I have like a BRB thing set up? I do have it. Um, yeah, I will be back in one minute. So. Sorry about that. Okay. Attempt connection from other instance. Yes, that was like, I think I already have it in my clipboard. So, it's like we're being connected to the orchestrator only. We'll pick a different message. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to... No, we, we can still hard code it for now. So, instead of infra hello... You know what? I kind of like it for hello. What if we add to it instance? One. And then yeah, that's fine. Ah, no, I, I, I want to distinguish 
I was thinking the orchestrator could be distinguished by just not saying the instance number, but I, I prefer it being explicit. So let's say I am uh, ID. Actually, we can fold these together, can't we? No, I'd rather not. I'm like, I could make the ID instance colon one, but then I need to parse it. I'll just keep it simple. So we'll call this um, realm. And let me, because we are t changing the API a little bit, I should retroactively go up and change this stuff. So ID orc. Orc. Or orchestrator. Because why not? I'm going to need to change, uh, fix the uh, lengths though. Recom Actually, let's put it underneath and I can easily see how much longer we made it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. So 13 added to 12 hex. I'm going to totally cheat here. So programmer. 1A. 1A. 1, 2, I mean. Plus 12, right? 30, it's just one E. Oh, well, we'll know if I got it wrong. I think it's A E. Oh, 9 E, right? 9 E. Actually, let's, let's uh, make that capital E and search for 9 2. This one's different, though. Okay, so what is this? Uh, actually, I'm just going, I'm not going to count the whole thing. I'm just going to put my cursor there, run column 31, put my cursor there, and we're in 89. So 89 minus 31. And then I need to subtract the number of these because they're counted twice. One, two, yeah, two, four, six, eight, ten, minus ten. So that's 48. Or 30 hex. So... B zero. Hope I got that right. Oh, thanks for following. Uh, Chickakaka. Or is that chic? Chic or chick? Let's see. Okay, so it should not be an orchestrator. Might as well check there. Instead, we want to. It's not unidentified, but let's. Let's just allow, let's allow a user to peek, uh, who has a direct coordinator ob reference to peek into the instance connections. So get instance connections. And let's see, what do I want to do? Let's assume we get back some kind of collection. Or connections, right? Let's assume that we can do this. One, connection size. And probably don't want to make a copy of it. And let's say we expect the instance to be, let's make that something other than one. How about we'll call it 482? Well, no, hold on. It has to be zero or one to match our configuration. Actually, that's another use case. That's another use case I'll do later. So future stream. Um, ignore instance connections from unrecognized uh, from inst instance number from from out of range. Out of range instance number. Probably also we want to ignore someone who claims to be ourselves. Right? Ignore instance connections from self instance number. Okay. That means if it's if it's zero, the only one it could be is one. So I do have to say one. So connection zero. Uh, let's say it comes it comes in here as instance in, or index, and then expect the uh, well. Actually, that's probably enough, right? 
Because the other thing I was going to add to it is the actual web socket, but we don't really have one. We're just oh no, we do, we do. So I can just I can do that. I can assert that the orc web socket is equal to the connections zero uh, ws. Okay, so none of this will compile yet because we have to fill in the details. Get instance connections right here. It's going to return. Let's call it a map. Actually, if it's going to be a map, then this, I can't do that. What I can do is say const auto. No, I can just do, be, I can do begin, right? Begin. I just have to dereference it. And then it's not index, is it? It's first. And I don't know what else well, I'm going to put in there, but I think I definitely want it to be a structure. So second dot ws. Okay. So it's going to be a map from size t to instance connection. Uh, how about instance instance record it's our it's this instance is record of another instance and we will return a reference so again this is a backdoor api that um, other components won't be able to get to because they access the coordinator through the i coordinator and we're making it part of the uh subclass Oh, hey, Pimp. Pemperson, what is this? I am working on a game. I'm working on the server infrastructure to a game. So if you'd like, there's a link below to my notebook. And I have some diagrams in here under Notes Omni Radius, Server Ar System Architecture, and ser Server Realm Architecture. So I'm making a cluster of servers to run my game. It's going to be in Amazon Web Services. And right now I'm filling in the details of how the servers in the cluster connect to each other and identify with each other and and this special orchestrator server, how how it's identified. Th this guy just is responsible for setting up the cluster. So uh, we take a lot of notes. I started taking notes because Adam takes notes. I think I went a little further than Adam in that, uh, in the, at least in the OneNote where he does a lot of notes in his text editor. I've been doing it all in one note and then uh, making it all public. And then recently Adam made his public too. So I like, I like to hope that um, we're helping each other out in uh, note taking, but I thought it was really important to take a lot of notes uh, for you guys for one thing. And the other thing is it's, it's really helps get organized. So when I sit down before a stream, I set up a plan and that kind of gives me a, a framework in which I, I keep get my mind focused on what am I going to do so that I don't get sidetracked. And when I'm done with something, I'll go back here. I'm like, did I have anything else I wanted to do? And also it gives you guys a heads up about what I'll be talking about. So if this stuff is extremely boring to you, you could skip it for the day and go watch someone else. That's fine. And, um, I know hopefully in the future I'll be able to look ahead more than one stream and then you'll kind of get an idea of, oh, on Wednesday he, he'll get into, I don't know, like Redux or React or Pixie.js or something and then you'll know when to tune in. But unfortunately I'm not that organized yet. I'm only able to plan one stream in advance, which is really like half an hour in advance. But uh, yeah. So yeah, um, you have any, if you have any specific questions, let me know, but it's it's at the very early stage. So I just made this diagram four days ago and all the bits and pieces of the of the server, I kind of, it took me a while to plan this out in my head. And then four days ago, I wrote it all down. And I, I really, I'm only working on this part of it yet. There's a lot of these pieces left to go. So, but if you got a specific question, let me know. I'm wondering how to do C++ server stuff. We, you don't have to watch past broadcasts. If you got a specific question, I can go over it. The, a s server sounds like sometimes uh, an intimidating word, like you have, a, have to have a lot of stuff. Thanks for the follows, guys. 
But really all a server is, is just a program that is listening for connections. And listening for connections, if you literally, if you just go to Google and you type in socket listen, inevitably for your favorite programming language or environment, you'll find, uh, uh, if, not, if not, you could qualify it. Like, like uh, let's say you've heard Node.js, right? If you just look this up, you'll, you'll quickly be led into examples and APIs on how to do a server. So that's the key, is servers are programs that listen for network connections on sockets, one way or another. And, well, I guess there are certain servers that, like, have other alternative communication, like shared memory. But um, once you learn how to do a server web style, the concept is the same. It's just the, the connection method is diff might be different. Uh, my server isn't much now other than it responds to web requests and web, web responses. And that I've been building up over the last 20, uh, 200 hours. Um, it's a bit much to catch up on. I actually do have a diagram if you really want to see what are the bits and pieces. Where did I put it? Web server high level diagram. So at the highest level, there's your web server, right? Then you have to have, if you're doing web sockets, that's a special component you need. Ultimately, you need a transport layer, and I broke it up into, um, how did I, oh, this is, mm, these two should be swapped. So think, uh, I'll fix this later, but web server goes to HTTP, and uh, what I was saying, transport layer, you need some way to get to the network. So I have it in two pieces. There's the piece that knows the HTTP side of a transport, and then there's a, the part that talks to sockets, and because it's different a little bit between Windows, Linux, and Mac, I have a system abstractions library that kind of the API is the same for all OSs, but the implementation is a little bit different. So yeah, the transport layer and in between is this HTTP that knows the protocol. And all stuff on the side are, you need to, if you're doing JSON, you need something for that. If you're working with Unicode, UTF-8, uh, URI is like URLs and stuff. Inevitably you'll run into base64 encoding for certain things, and hash functions. So I developed all of these little bits and pieces over my stream and kind of assembled it together. I make stuff from scratch, so I'm kind of a weirdo. Uh, most people will find that all this stuff has already been done for you. If you just pick up a, a beginning intro to Node.js, you'll, you'll have all this stuff given to you within the first 10 minutes or so. Um, so in C++, it's harder than in JavaScript because... C++ is an older language, so a lot of the concepts and things you need aren't built into the language. I mean, concepts related to the web aren't built in, or um, they're, they've just been done a lot of different ways, and you have to kind of find the one you like. JavaScript's much easier, and a lot of stuff is built into either the language or the frameworks built around the language. So if you're just learning on how to do server stuff, um, if you're not already familiar with... If you're familiar with JavaScript, I would say do a JavaScript server first. If you really want to do C++ server, then yeah, you're going to need to learn sockets. Uh, pick up, uh, if you already have a framework you use for C++, see what kind of sockets layer support it has and go go there. Otherwise, just uh, Google search uh, C++ socket listen. All right, catching up on chat again. Welcome back playing with scissors. What's the Twitch bug? Oh yeah, I ran into that today. Um, is that Twitch or is that Yata or, or both? I en end up having accidental colons in my chat just searching for emotes. So, you assume that there's a framework for C++ to make servers. I don't think there is because sockets, at least, okay, so there might be in the latest C++, but I, I'm, I'm a C++ 11. That's as far as I've caught up to the to the rest of the world and as far as i know in c plus plus 11 the sockets are not built into the language or the standard library and i'll say so um, you'd have to sort of do a little bit by yourself do i have a c plus plus framework i'd recommend uh, if you really want a lot of support from the framework i would say boost if you if we're doing gui stuff then the GTK, that might that's not, I think that's the right one. I'm thinking about the cross-platform GUI toolkit. 
And uh, but if if you're just beginning and you want to do a lot of stuff from scratch like I do, I I would just recommend getting familiar with what comes with the standard library. Oh, thanks for following Blueberry King. Okay, so yeah, I got a little sidetracked. Yeah, so server stuff. I have already built up a bunch of stuff. So when you see my code, you'll see stuff like uh, where is it? WebSocket, right? Like that took me three or four streams to do, but now that I have it, I'm kind of building off of it. So if you're coming in now, it might seem like I already have a framework. It's just stuff I've done in the past that I'm now building off of, which I kind of I kind of enjoy doing. I kind of feel like I'm building a complex architecture from from the from the foundation up, and it kind of feels good. You kind of feel, and, and flip side is, if it crashes, you feel bad because it's your fault. Not you can't blame the framework if you if you made the framework yourself, right? All right, so instance record. Let's comment this first and say this method uh, returns. Actually, this should be const. We don't want them to change stuff. Well, that's probably best to keep it const. This returns read only reference to the internal. Map uh, used to to organize connections established with other established with other realm instances. Okay, I should say server instances, shouldn't I? Okay, there's no parameters in. What am I doing? This is just a return, and we just say this is returned. And again, being redundant, that's because documentation parsers might take this text and split it up into two different places, and I kind of want people to find it no matter where they land. All right. Okay, so we need to define this type. And probably need to include map, because it probably, yeah, I did not include map. So, by the way, if you're, if you're really new to C++, when you see includes that don't have a .h, it's probably C++ standard library. Especially if there's no directory name in front. If you see a dot .h, it's probably C. Dot .cpp, especially if there is a directory name in front, it's C++ from something that's not standard. So this is not standard. It's a library I wrote. This is also not standard because it's another header in the same uh, games server. This is standard C header, and these are standard C++ headers. Map is a nice collection like dictionary for organizing things by keys. Memory, I pull in because I use shared pointers. Standard def is for really old school stuff like size t, like size t. Okay, I need instance record defined. I like to define internal types like this. A lot of C++ is sort of open to your style, so lots of different ways to do it, P pros and cons, people have Opinionated battles about it, but ultimately the programmer has a bit of freedom. And I'm going to just put my structure definition here. Const standard map const. Yeah, so it's saying that calling this doesn't change the server in any way. And what it's returning is a const. It's kind of, it's, to read it, it's kind of not in, in English order, but you're returning a constant reference to a map where the keys are size t's and the values are instance records. And calling it doesn't change the server. Boga t. I need some boga t. I'm out of boga t right now. Okay, this holds uh, all the information the instance has on other instances. Actually, I'm, e I'm even thinking we might want to hold on instance records if they disconnected. But... Let me not think too far ahead. So the only thing for now we need is this is the web socket used to communicate with the other instance. Okay, so that's a shared pointer. To you might ask why it's to say it twice. It's a convention I follow where this is the namespace. It usually matches the name of the library, and this is the class. Just so happens I, the WebSocket class is in a library right, that right now only has the one class, so it's, the names are very, very similar. 
I kind of debate my, with myself if a library is so small that it has only one class, maybe I should fold them together, but I haven't gotten there, I haven't gone that far yet. I really don't like making names in the global namespace because I think like it's sort of putting, placing a, maybe a, a burden on people reusing my code that they have to pick up names in the global namespace. Here they, they only have to pick up my namespace. You don't know what a header is. You know, I just noticed my uh, my color key on my camera isn't is screwing up. Let me let me quickly adjust that. Make it a little bit more aggressive there. There we go. So a, a header, it's a ugly artifact of the past. It's it's on its way out, right? Programming languages these days that are newer don't have them. Alternatives to C and C plus plus are removing them. It's just an old school way of connecting modules together. So modern compilers and interpreters will connect things together simply by reference, that by the name alone. And you just include, if you include A and B and A happens to mention B, the compiler says, hey, you gave me A and B, A talks about B, so it connects automatically. In old school C and C++, compiler looks at A, is done with A. Looks at B, is done with B. So if A needs to use B, when you comp when the compiler is looking at A, A has to say, hey, I need B and go here if, to find B. And so that's through these header files. So it's sort of a relic. Hopefully it will go away from all programming languages before not too long. So it's kind of hard for an old language like C and C++ to change that drastically. Okay, I need to place this method is yeah i'm gonna place it there I, I keep it in the same order from in the declaration in the header see they're in that order to how they are in the implementation what does it not like it doesn't like that probably that this isn't declared and i haven't returned anything by the way i don't really this kind of irritates me that I have to say it twice, and I know that there's a a goofy little trick you can do now, which, and so I like to do it, which is you say auto, and then you add an arrow, and the type goes there. Then I can remove this. So, if you see that with auto, it's a special syntax for that you want to place the return value on the right side so that the class scope can get used by the return type. Clever, huh? Or maybe obscene, I don't know. It's, it's sort of debatable. Okay, let me catch up on chat a little bit. I look, programming looks simple and fun, whether it's your experience to tell a different story, constantly running to a wall, not knowing what you're doing. So, Allens, what I would suggest is what I did. Um, get connected to a community of developers, whether it's through Twitch or through um, uh, uh, Code Academy or whatnot. Um, the, the solution to running into a wall and get frustrated is to have other developers to help you out. Either just giving you an idea of what to try or um, maybe going further and tutoring you. You, you, you kind of need that unless you have a really strong iron will to just bust through that wall. Um, and if I, look, if I make programming look simple and fun, it's not on purpose. I just um, I haven't been doing it long enough to make it look like that. It, it's... It, it's been fun for me even when I do run into walls because I have other people I can talk to um, and ask them, hey, this is a problem. Can you help me with it? And it's no longer frustrating. It's actually fun. First time in stream and you enjoyed it so far? Oh, great. Oh, you're, I, I recognize 3D Extended. So 3D Extended is now VIP 3D Extended. And Romania, hey, aren't you also from Adam's channel? Seem very familiar. Just noticed I'm using VS Code. Where, what am I using for debug? That's a great question. Am I answering these chat in the wrong order? That's okay. So for debug, VS Code is actually pretty good with debug these days. You can configure Either, uh, how does this show? CPP VS Debug, 
which means there's a plug, there's actually a plugin or extension. I think it's from the C++ extension to VS Code where it knows how to use Microsoft's Visual Studio debugger. It, it's okay. It's not perfect. And you also have other options like, uh, I think CPP debug is just GDB. And if you're on Linux or the Mac, you also have LLDB and uh, GDB. So the integration with debuggers is actually pretty good. But there, there are some things like earlier this stream, um, I, it won't stop automatically on an exception that's thrown. So I, I, I revert back to using Visual Studio sometimes to uh, debug when I have to. I've actually been trying to avoid running the debugger just by using test-driven development that the changes and feature addition is so incremental and simple enough that each test kind of ends up being its own little mini debugging environment, so to speak. So uh, did I miss any other chat? Global variables cause a global warning. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I, I don't use many global variables, so maybe that's why I haven't been seeing warnings. Thanks for following uh, Euphius. I think most developers are happy to help each other figure out problems. That's not the same as other developers being good at helping solve problems. Oh, happy to help each other? Yeah, so, I mean, when you're getting help from someone that's not very good, you'll figure it out pretty good. And maybe the relationship will swap and you'll be helping them after a while. Um, combination, find someone that you enjoy working with and who you're learning from, right? I think Adam says, says the same kinds of things. Yeah, so I do re I do recognize Romani hate. I'll, you know what? I'll, I'm going to call this a uh, plug for Adam's channel because Adam's community has been really nice to me and I've really had a good time in his channel. So I'm rewarding anyone who I recognize from Adam's channel as they're a VIP in my channel. So you guys rock. If you don't know Adam, a uh, shout out. I don't have a shout out command. But Twitch TV and I'm one three five three one. Go follow and subscribe and all that good stuff on Adam's channel. I kind of look up to him as a Twitch dev game, a Twitch game dev streamer, who who I learn a lot from. So I like to, I like the community, and I'm rewarding everyone I know from that community as VIPs here. I don't know Handmade Hero though. Could you explain shared pointers? Yes, indeed, I will do that. Well, let me first write. I forget stuff unless I write it down. So I'm going to take that note and okay, paste text only. I will look that up later. I'm still looking for people to follow on Twitch, especially dev streamers that I can learn from. So let me explain shared pointers. Oh, by the way, pick 9117. Header files aren't really going away for sure in C and C++. I just predict that they will based on the fact that the standards are still evolving and other languages are showing very good ways to make large-scale systems without header files. So I, I predict that eventually, may, maybe it'll take a really long time, I don't know, but eventually they'll revise the language so that you don't need header files anymore. Maybe something like D that already shows how to do that kind of thing, right? They don't have header files, I don't think. So I just predict it'll happen. I, I don't, I'm not saying that it, they will. Okay, Twitch series to make a game without libraries in C? Oh, cool. So let me explain shared pointers. Where do I use them, for example? Cool, yeah, I got lots of recommendations, so definitely have to watch that. Um, let me let me think of a good example of shared pointers. Probably in the tests I was writing earlier. No, not the tests. The code that we're testing. So. Oh, hold on, hold on a sec. You'll get to see my mute overlay for a second. That's the overlay I put up because of my wacky se and strange sense of humor. Whenever um, someone comes home and I have to say hi and all that stuff, don't have a private office yet. So yeah, there's occasional interruptions. Um, yeah, so shared pointer. Here's an example. Okay, maybe this isn't the best example. 
gosh, let me think. I, I want to have a good example to explain it well. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll do my, I'll try my best with this. So, this component uses a helper called webgate. And we ask the webgate, call, call us back. That's what setting up a delegate is. Call us back when we get a new WebSocket connection. And when it calls us back, it's going to give us a shared pointer to a WebSocket. So the reason that you use either shared pointer or unique pointer is to main, manage the ownership of a pointer. So if I just made this an ordinary pointer, it would still work. Problem is, we would have to, f to take active we would have to take active steps to delete this at the correct time and place right so somewhere in our code would have to do a delete ws otherwise we get a memory leak and worse things could happen like if there is something in the destructor for websocket it would never get called because we would never delete the websocket right so you could have all sorts of weird things and then other bugs happen where you delete something at the wrong time you use it after it's deleted so it gets to be a, a hassle. So these managed or um, the, the I guess they're called managed managed pointers. Take a pointer and kind of wrap around it an ownership maintenance structure. You can say so. There's like for shared pointer, there's a reference counter. So it's very similar to a reference in any kind of garbage collected language, or even even some that aren't. Where every time you uh, give the WebSocket or the, th the, the shared pointer to some other function, the reference count goes up. And when that function no longer needs it or the function returns and they didn't store a copy themselves, reference count goes down. Reference count never gets to zero, that's when the delete happens. So it kind of takes care of calling the delete and the destructor automatically at the correct time, as long as you follow the rules. So one rule would be, I was showing earlier how Here's the WebSocket, and we're telling it to call us back. If I were to give the WebSocket its its own pointer back to it, so it's called a circular reference. So WebSocket would never be destroyed because it would hold on to a reference to itself. So you, you, you need to break circular references. In any kind of managed pointer situation, you, you don't want these circular references, so you break them by having either what's called a weak pointer, which you can get back the shared pointer, as long as the reference count didn't reach zero and your weak pointer doesn't get countered as in the count reference count, if that makes sense. So shared pointer has that reference count. So we can pass around this WebSocket to lots of different places and everything that holds onto a copy of that pointer will be counted as a reference. And sometimes you'll see a special sort of subset of the shared pointer, which is called a weak pointer. I mean, a unique pointer. That's that's one where specifically things have been prevented by the type unique pointer prevents certain things like making copies of it is not permitted. You'll get a compiler error. So instead of having a reference count, it's simply assumed that there's either one or zero references. And when uh, you uh, delete the unique pointer, it just deletes the object itself. So it's closer to a raw pointer um, in that there's no shared reference count, but it's, it, it does still automatically call the destructor at the right time, and you can move them. You can move a unique pointer, you just can't make a copy of it. So did that, I hope that explained it well enough. I'm not the best at explaining these things. I think I read that at some point they want to add a lightweight garbage collector in C++. Yeah, so, a uh, uh, point about garbage collection. So, in C++, there's no garbage collector, which means that, for example, last reference for this WebSocket goes away, it's immediately the destructor's called. doesn't matter what thread you're in. You could be in a worker thread. You could be in the main thread. doesn't matter. It gets deleted at that moment. Problem with that, let's say you're in a thread that the WebSocket itself made, and then the WebSocket's destructor waits until that thread exits. Well, you just basically shot yourself in the foot because if the web server... But the WebSocket's last reference is released from inside that thread. It's going to wait for itself to, to quit. So it's going to be basically waiting forever and you're locked up. So there, there are special holes you can fall into with it. With the garbage collector, what happens is when you release the last reference, 
It's not immediately destroyed. It goes on. It either stays where it is with a zero reference count or it goes on to a special collection where another thread in the background, usually called the garbage collector thread or background thread or main, ha, whatever you call it, uh, maintenance, housekeeping, occasionally it'll run and it'll go through the list of everything that's reached zero count or has been placed into the garbage and then delete them at that point. So there are um, pros and cons, right? With the garbage collector, when it, it triggers and starts deleting everything, it can cause a sudden performance hit to your app because suddenly you have some thread that's just going through the garbage and deleting everything. And then on the flip side, there's the problems I just described where if you're deleting it immediately when the reference count reaches zero, you might be in the thread context that you, you really can't do that because you'll get screwed. Um, so uh, pros and cons. And you, you could make your own garbage collector. I could make a worker thread where every time, and, and I can make a special shared pointer. Um, you, can, you can customize a shared pointer to tell it, instead of calling delete when the reference count goes to zero, call something else. So I could make it call a function that takes the pointer and gives it to a garbage collector somehow. And I could have another thread that every once in a while wakes up and destroys everything that got give, given to it through the garbage, through that function call. So you could, you could do it yourself, and that's probably how, if it's added to the language, it would be implemented is uh, through the standard library. Can you debug who is holding references to a share pointer? I think you can a little bit, be, but I don't know myself very well. You In the debugger, you can inspect what's in the shared pointer and you can see um, the, 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 the management structure. I think you can, you can see the number of references there are, but to know who is holding, you'd have to have some kind of record where you record what functions incremented and which functions decremented the shared pointer. I'm not sure if that's built into every shared pointer implementation. I, 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 would, I would hazard to guess that in Boost, there's probably something to do that, but I don't know personally. It's probably different on every implementation. And yeah, unique pointer, it's a singleton, sort of. Singleton's usually used in reference to a class, and unique pointer is... is is used with instances so like you, you can make two like i could have uh two unique pointers to this structure if i wanted it's not really a singleton anymore so but it's sort of like singleton in that you can't make a cop once you have the thing you can't make a copy of it so yes and no and yeah uh, most of the time you don't really care who is holding on to the references it's only when you the reference can never reach a zero and you're like okay where did i screw up either either it's a you had a circular reference or you um you broke the rule like you can i can take this ws and i can say get right and say this uh foolish right equals ws get well what type is foolish it's a raw pointer to a websocket i've just broken i've just um opened up the shared pointer and grabbed that raw pointer straight out if i keep that around and use it then um, I can get in trouble later. If that, if that WS reference count goes to zero, this is going to point to garbage or, or random stuff now. So um, usually when you're debugging shared pointers, the bug is either you made a circular reference, you did something foolish, like you grabbed a raw pointer and you, you didn't, um, like you held on to it and used it in some later context, which is really dangerous. Or um, another special case is where a thread exits early and none of the code that would have ran that decrements the reference count actually ran. And so you, uh, you could have objects that didn't know they should have been destroyed because the thread that had reference just quit. You know, that can happen. I think over time you just recognize, you realize like what are the possible ways that the bug, like if it's not going to zero, the reference count, you know, what are the possible, what are the most likely reasons why? And you kind of look for that. But in my experience, once if, if you really work hard in following the rules and how you're supposed to use shared pointer, unique pointer, you end up running into fewer bugs than, than you used to with raw pointers. But you know your mileage may vary. Some people are really good at uh, properly using raw pointers, and they know when to create them, when to delete them, and more power to them. For me, personally, I screw up a lot, and so using um, managed objects to manage... Uh, life cycles of objects really helps me out. I have a lot fewer bugs because of that.
you like your VAP? Oh, congratulations. Anyone else from Adam's channel, let me know if I forgot about you. Okay. So, did I, I got way off track, didn't I? Okay, yeah, yeah, I was building up the instance record. I have WebSocket. Oh, actually, most of it compiles now. This one doesn't, though. Why not? Oh. That's a dot I just missed. Okay, so it now should compile. It just won't work. Oh, no, it doesn't compile yet. What did I do wrong here? Oh, I... I what did I do here? I forgot to remove that line. Again, with a bug. What's it saying? How come the... That's weird. Usually F8 brings me to the bug, but it's just bringing me to the CMake warning that I know about already. Okay, we'll just go to it manually. 132. What did I do here? Oh, I didn't return the right thing. So let's just be cheeky and return nothing. Just to get it to compile. Yeah, so I got a, I got a warning. That's fine. It, I want it to fail, and then we'll fix it. That's what test-driven development's all about. Oh, interesting. It got stuck on a test I haven't touched yet today. That's interesting. Oh, I wonder if it's because this is trying to use a port that this one is keeping open somehow. That's probably what it is. So I'm going to guess that this getting stuck is a side effect of this one of these tests failing. Which is what I expected. I expected these to be... F oh, actually, I didn't expect that one. So I broke that one. Let's fix that first. 498. Am I using a third-party testing framework? Yeah. So I really like Google Test. You can just look up Google Test. Google C++ Test Framework. It follows the X unit pattern. So you can have uh, what's called a test fixture, which has common setup for each test. And then you just, using this macro, you define each test case. And then inside, you can use these macros to um, cause your test to fail if anything isn't what you expect. And uh, yeah, I really like it. It's lightweight. It's uh, maintains. It's awesome. Do I, I have experienced unit testing OpenGL? Not at all. That's kind of scary. Um, I'd like to learn, but uh, I'm thinking back to when I was playing around with OpenGL and, and uh, I did a little bit trying to make, uh, I was like working on uh, trying to learn OpenGL by trying to make a Minecraft clone. Because isn't that what you do when you want to learn graphics is you try to clone Minecraft. Um, and I was doing that and I remember running into bugs and what I, what I ended up doing the closest to any kind of testing would be I ran a trace tool and looked at the OpenGL calls, and I, I visually said, is this, the, or is this the correct sequence? And I would do that especially if it didn't draw correctly, but that's, that's as close as I ever got with unit testing graphics code. So, hey, I'm glad you're learning something. Oh, you would like to learn too, but it's really ugly. Oh, um, the graphics, yeah. I think debugging user interfaces in general is really tough to the point that I kind of, I'm on the side of, if, if people argue like what should, merits being unit tested, I'm on the side of those who might say, well, unit user interfaces don't need unit tests per se because they're really just front ends and the real work is being done by the thing the user interface is talking to under the hood. But I feel that's, I'm, I, I kind of, I'm kind of being lame about that, but I've tried to, to unit test UIs and it seems like you get, there's less return on investment. There's a lot of work to test graphic stuff and uh, I don't catch as much. You know what I really like to do if I, if I get better at organization is actually track how many bugs I get over a certain period of code or time and then categorize, well, how many of them were UI bugs? How many of them were server bugs? I would hazard a guess that most uh, bugs are not in the UI. Or if they are, they're quickly caught. So another, another thing about unit testing is you don't need a unit test. If you can see the bug, then you are the unit test, right? You see, you see a bug. There's a regression. You see, you see it right, right in front of you. Um, 
if there's a lot of different screens, sure, maybe your unit test is just to run them all through and have some, some testers stare at it, and, and if they see something wrong, they hit a button. Um, once you catch a bug, the unit test has really done its job. Then you f flag it, you maybe enter a bug ticket number, and then when you fix a bug, you don't really... If the unit test helps you, that's fine, but usually you go in and you find the root cause, you fix it, and you verify, and you're done. So it's hard, it's hard to automate, too, user interface testing, I would say. So it's just return on investment I'm, I'm not sure about. So I hope you guys don't mind. I get distracted by the questions a lot. All right. So, yeah, the test that failed, I wanted to see that was inside this test, right? It might be because I miscounted the number of characters there. It probably is. Let me manually count it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 1, A, 1, B, 1, C, 1, D, 1, E. I did miscount by 1. 1, F. So everywhere I did that. So I'm going to need to go back and clean this up because I do not want to have this ugly mess where I'm doing the WebSocket encoding. I'm going to go through here when I refactor and do the right thing would be to make a second WebSocket that does the encoding of this. You know, basically it does this work for me. And I would, instead of sending it directly into the connection, I would send it through the client side WebSocket, which would talk to the connection once it's encoded. And then I don't have to worry about the encoding. Okay. Is it worth to test web apps? I think it depends. If the web app has a lot of functions in it, I think it's important to unit you know, test the functions. It's it's maybe the interactive part that's it's, you have to you have to you have to do a trade study, right? You have to say, well, how. What's the likelihood of there being bugs? Uh, how many bugs have we run into in the past? How likely are we uh, or to have bugs? Uh, in the interactive parts, is it worth making unit tests for them, or is it better to just to wait until they happen or have a have a, someone who just once in a while looks and sees if it works? And uh, if uh, which which one costs them the most? Right, pick the one that's least cost. Personally, I don't. Th I would be on the side of test the function stuff and not the interactive stuff. Unless if you can functionalize some of the interaction, then yeah, you test that too. Am I publishing my code on what is this project? So yeah, sorry, I don't have a command, but there's a, uh, below, there's a link to my notebook and I transitioned from the project started as making my own web server from scratch in C++. And now it's to use that web server to make a game. And so that's probably going to, what's going to stay on for the foreseeable future is building up this game. Right now it's all server-side stuff. And where am I publishing it? All of the reusable parts I want to make open source. And so they're on my GitHub. So you go to, there's a link down there, but it's github slash, github.com slash rymu8354. And all the components there are things like the WebSocket, the HTTP protocol, uh, JSON, hash functions. So you'll find all that stuff in GitHub. The actual game, though, I'm keeping private for now. Kind of like Adam keeps Botland private. Thanks for following, guys. Oh, you're on mobile. Well, let me give you a link. So if you just go to github.com. Let me check my own link. And no one really asked me about it. But let's 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 pretend someone asks... Gee, Raimu, why are you using a rabbit for your avatar? I have an, a not-so-awesome answer. It's that I was sitting there setting up my profile, I think it was Twitter at one point. So the first time I needed an avatar, I'm like, I don't want to put my face up there. And I just picked the random thing out of my head was I had a picture of a bunny. I'm like, I'll use that. So there's really nothing behind it. So yeah, all of the repositories on that link I just sent are all to all the low-level stuff. And you'll see here, I was doing that a lot from mid-June up to about a month ago. And there's some light contributions, mostly bugs I've been fixing, but um, 
going forward if it's if it's my game specifically it's going to be private but if it's anything that's useful to you guys for reuse and other component and other projects it should be here um and and you're welcome to uh open tickets if you find bugs or other things fork it um try it out critique is all good and yeah do I handle templates in H files? Um, yes and no. Well, for one, I don't use, I don't make a lot of templates myself. Let me find. Oh, JSON is a good example of that. Yeah. So JSON. Oh no, it was a good example of it. It used to be a template, but I decided to just flatten the template out by just having lots of operators. Is not a good example. What's what's a good example? Oh, hash function is, yes, HMAC. So, where's the template stuff? No, it's not H, oh, it's in templates, there we go. So I, I put the template stuff in its own header because templates are scary and you can really get into trouble if you do the wrong thing. But there are certain things which were like, whenever there's a pattern, that you want to repeat the same pattern but with small variation, and the variation can fit into a template argument. That's a good candidate. So here's here's an example. I, I want to turn, um, what was this? I want to compute the message digest of some data and return it uh, um, as a string instead of bytes vector. So it came in as a byte vector, and the hash function itself is type in equals type out. So the hash function is going to return a vector of bytes. But hey, sometimes I want a, a string out of it. And I want the string to be hex digits. And um, so you can make a function that just does it for one hash function. But I'm like, I have four or five different hash functions. So I made it, the parameter is the hash function. And so it calls it. And then the thing the template does is it, no matter what hash function it is, it does the string, the, the vector to string conversion. So, um, yeah, I use templates, but mostly just for when there's a pattern. And I try to keep it simple, like these small little utilities. So I don't have huge, complicated templates. But um, one rule I follow with templates, I don't, I don't think you have to do this, but I put everything in the HPP file, and my reasoning for that is a template is not final code. It's a recipe to, for the compiler to make code as it's needed. So it's if someone used bytes to string with SHA-1, then the compiler would say, okay, let me apply that recipe with the final hash function SHA-1, and it'll make a distinct um, function, which is it's, uh, the SHA-1 version of bytes to string. And so in my mind that when the compiler is, is making something based off of a, a recipe and not final code, it all belongs in the header. I think uh, people can it, people can argue justifiably that you could split some of this up. You could probably put that in the CPP file, but um, I guess I've never been convinced of the of the usefulness of that. Maybe it's to make it more performant or smaller code. But I've always found it's easiest to think of templates as being a recipe that's incomplete. You need uh, the argument to be finalized somewhere else. And I need to catch up on chat a little bit. Oh, I guess I didn't I didn't miss anything. You're welcome, Romania. Uh another thing is uh I don't know if if this irritates people, but I, I like if it's C plus plus if it's a header meant to be consumed by a C plus plus, I'm explicit with HPP. A lot of people will just call it dot H. I like to reserve dot H for C and maybe C plus plus. This can't be used by C, so that's sort of like the clue. Alrighty, so yeah, that. Oh, did I? I don't think I searched for all the instances of that. Do I have any plans for the game yet? Hold on. Uh, so all my plans are are pretty vague right now. Let me let me find that page again. Where did I put it? Close it again. I keep doing this. I keep closing my OneNote. Okay. So, the plan so far is really just have servers communicate with each other, establish the instances, 
and then it gets into vague territory about some of the ideas I had about uh or did I even write this down? Oh, on the cornerstones. So if you skip the the technical stuff, the plans I have in general are I want a game where there are lots of different things you can do, but the at the core it's gonna be an RPG. And it I really liked games like Ultima Three. And I didn't I don't know if there's a better term for it, but the swords and magic theme is something I I have planned where you'll you'll be you'll pick a class or you'll your class will evolve as you make decisions. But at the same time there's gonna be a lot of different things you could do. So if you feel like taking on a challenge to clear out a dungeon, there'll be that. If you're more into like searching the world for hidden things, there'll be that. If you want to make your own world, I'm I'm haven't yet fleshed this out, but I'm thinking certain like super users in the game might be able to actually make their own areas of the game. Or just make in another way is any player might have their own special pocket universe or world or area where they can build something either creative mode or maybe you have to go out in the world and collect things that you can use to craft. You know, people like crafting games, people like uh uh, creative mode and I see that um, I, wa I want to just see how I'm going to plant those ideas as seeds and see what comes out of it really but uh, my goal all along this being not the first time I've been trying to do this game but like the second or third iteration is at the core I, I wanted to make my own game in this in the same grain or genre as games like Ultima 3 and uh, yeah that's the plan it's about as concrete as it is right now. But um, I guess adding to it this aspect of community, the multiplayer aspect, that you could have friends join you and help you out, or you could uh, maybe even uh, be competing against other players somehow. It's really not flesh talk completely yet, and your opinions are as great as anyone's. If you have if you have any ideas for me, give me a, uh, let me know. Do you plan on using OpenGL or something higher level? I was going to stick with I, I was going to use Pixie JS, but Adam's like, you should look at Phaser, right? Is that what he said? Or Pulsar? Hold on. I put this in the note for today. Phaser as an alternative to Pixie JS. So either Pixie JS or Phaser or something WebGL, because I, I made a decision a little bit back that I want to put it in the browser because that really helps me out if I to enable a larger audience. People want to play it on the phone. People want to play it on different OSs that I might not know about. Um, putting in the browser and using standard frameworks like React, Pixie.js, uh, WebGL will um, maybe more likely to succeed. So yeah, gonna stick, try to stick inside the browser. And from my understanding, WebGL has enough of OpenGL that I would want, so, um, which wasn't the case like, I don't know, not that long ago. So I'm actually, it's kind of fortunate that things have gone to the point where you can you can do OpenGL type stuff all in the browser now. 3.js. Let me copy and paste that. Thank you very much. Always looking for ideas and I will follow up on them. How come that didn't work? I'm going to blame Yada for that one. There we go. Thanks. So why don't I use using instead of type def? Um, where was I using type def? Type def is kind of contextual, so there's different kinds of type. Maybe it was when I was looking at the template stuff, right? Uh, I lost where I was there. Yeah, this is this what you mean, the type def here? So if this is what you meant, um, this doesn't have so much to do with using as it does that this is actually a new type that um, isn't defined elsewhere. It's built off of other types like vector. Um, but a more general, why don't you see me using the using keyword? I don't like to smash namespaces together. It's sort of an opinion of mine. Um, so not I don't really have good justification other than I would rather 
have lots of std colon colons and stuff to be explicitly naming the namespace I'm pulling out of rather than using a type def. Um, uh, maybe my opinion will change over time. Maybe you guys will convince me of a better way, but uh, I don't mind the extra text. A lot of it, uh, it's copy paste anyway, or I can make macro, uh, make a shortcuts to type it for me quickly. It's only three characters. Lots of reasons, but it, it, I like. I, I guess I like to keep namespaces separate. Okay, see a three D extended. Thanks for coming by. All right, so. Let's go to the last edit point. Yes, so I was going to make sure that that was fixed now. Okay, well that one was fixed, but this one is still crashing. Okay, yeah, so we fixed the, the uh, orchestrator test becoming broken, that regression. Now we're going to move on to, yeah, so this is code I just haven't written yet. That it tries to identify itself as the other realm instance and we're not recognizing it. It's actually failing where it's failing on that it's not identified, that it is still unidentified. Yeah, okay, so we just need to fill in the code. So uh, let's go to the code where we would recognize it. So it'll be right here, right? So we're going to extend this a little bit. So we're going to say if it is JSON, and what did I call it? Uh, realm no id if id equals it's going to be either realm or orc right so if it's orc then it's an orchestrator else if actually let's pull this out so um actually the way i this is sort of a, a design flaw in my code i would like to do this Unfortunately, it doesn't compile because I haven't and I haven't gotten around to fixing it. Or maybe it does work. Oh, never mind. It, it does work. It must be non-string types I'm having a problem with. The uh, because this is overloaded. The in index or the 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 value conversion is overloaded. So the implicit cast to string works, but implicit cast to other types I think have ambiguity issues. So if id equals orc. So now I can just, it makes it easier. I can say else if id equals realm. All right. Hey there. I don't know how to say your name. Tix? Are you okay if I say Tix? Not, calling, not talking about using standard or something, but call using function pointer equals void pointer. Oh, um, well, I've been using... Oh, this is an example of what where I've been using something else. Why am I not using? Um, I I think the answer for if this you're talking about this is, uh, why am I not uh, doing using? Maybe I just don't know how to to do it the way you're thinking. But um, the whole intent here is to take this signature, uh, this this uh signature of a function, and give it a name, so that I could use it down here and it's readable. So it's a template that takes a hash function. So what is a hash function? It's a function, or a pointer to a function that takes a vector of bytes and returns a vector of bytes. So that's why. And it's C++11, but I don't claim to know all of C++11. If I did know C++11, I'd be trying to use C++17 by now. So I'm still learning. If you see something that I'm doing wrong, please let me know. Thanks for following non-board. Now you can tell how far behind I am. About a minute behind in reading chat. Oh, don't want to... Yeah. I guess I've been kind of distracted today. That's okay. Uh, I don't mind being distracted. I have to get a feel for how much people are willing to allow me to get distracted, though, because... Okay, it's kind of up to you guys. Like, if you want me to talk about... C++ in general, or you'd rather me do the code, it, it's up to you guys. I am enjoying both. I'm learning either way. My game will get written slower, but that's okay. Okay, so if it's a realm, we're going to... I think we'll just naively remove it and assume that for now we're just going to add it. So we're going to have a collection, I think, of, of uh, other instances. And we're just going to naively add it like this. 
uh, what did I name it? Instance <coughs> equals. We just have to put that into our aggregates here. So map. Oh, no, I made a type for this, didn't I? Oh no, I didn't. I I did not make a type for this. I just have it as a map. Here's another example where I might use a type def, just so I don't have to uh, change it in multiple places if I decide to change something. This probably won't change though, so I'll probably keep it the way it is. So other instances. All right. Okay, uh, this keeps track of uh, what this instance knows about the other instances of servers for the same realm. That's what it is. Oh, what happened? Oh, lost my cursor there for a second. All right, so yeah, this needs to be qualified because it's not with it's within the uh, namespace of coordinator. And this structure is not. It's within the realm server. Actually, you know, this shouldn't even be here. Well, it, it doesn't really hurt for, for it to be here, but I kind of want this to be only visible within this module. So one good way of doing that is called an anonymous namespace. Namespace and then just bracket means that anything in here doesn't pollute the global namespace or any other namespace, and also you can't get to it directly by name through any other module because I kind of want this to be private to this specific module. And yeah, this the uh, cost is that I have to further qualify it like that. Oh, you're talking to your mom? Well, it's always good. Everyone, call your mom. <laughs> I should do the same thing. Mom, if you're watching, I'm sorry I haven't been calling. Um, using map. Standard map. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Let me, uh, this is, this is, this isn't a good exam. This is a good example of why I'm streaming. And this is because I didn't even know you could do that. So I will read, I want to read more about it later. I, I like to research things to cement it, but thank you for that pointer. I will look into it later. It's probably something I need to learn. Type alias. Look, let me um, copy that as well. Thank you. All right. Other realm instances. I guess I named it. Sl no, it's the same. How come it doesn't like it? Oh, yeah. So we need to we need to cast this to size t. There's an example of how uh, uh, this doesn't quite work. Yeah, see, it doesn't know, do I want bool first or int or double? So yeah, I want int. And uh, this has to be, actually, let's break this up. So auto, uh, auto instance record equals that. So that'll actually create it if it didn't exist. And then once we have a reference to it, we can fill in the WebSocket. So yeah, this goofy stuff is because my JSON class isn't quite perfect and I still have to do these casts. Technically, I don't need to do that. Although it feels funny to do that because what if I have a negative number? But I do have a test I was going to uh, fill in later that to, ch to make sure that uh, it's not out of range. So when I do that test, I'll, I'll fix that. Another thing about test-driven development, it might seem a little odd that I know, I, I see right now that I should check if that's negative or out of range, right? And also I should check to see if the instance wasn't already connected. But I know already that I made unit tests for each of those um, error conditions, right? And I'm relying on the fact that when I get to filling in those tests, those tests will force me to make the code correct here. So I can skip, basically I can skip things now and make it simple just to start focusing on one thing at a time. Kind of building up the code based off of use cases. I think that helps in not writing code you don't need. Um, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, is that uh, if you, you end up writing a lot of checks that you didn't ever need because there's no use case that actually um, 
causes those tests to be useful, then you didn't need to write the tests in the first place. Um, and then the flip side is that it kind of forces you to be really good in your making your test cases to cover everything that might happen. So it's sort of a discipline thing. It might look weird. You might not agree with it, and that's fine. But anyway, that should be enough, right, to get that test to pass. Ooh, what is it saying? It failed to do... Oh. I just didn't see the error. Oh, I know what. It's that same error, uh, same warning as before. Do you post my planned notes for each stream somewhere? Yeah, so... You might be on mobile, so what I will do is give you a link. So today's notes... I've been trying to do have a link to the page directly. So if you follow that link, you'll get to my one note for today. So every stream will have a page, and they're all in that section. So I try to set up the plan beforehand, try to do everything that I plan, and then later I'll, I try to go back and do retrospective or fill-in stuff. I'm not always successful, but that's, a, that's my goal. Okay, did I miss anything else? Oh, the whole in for hello is a meme. You start with item, it's not really a standard. Yeah, I know, I was just joking. So playing with scissors, I'm, what I'm saying is if I continue the, the, the meme, maybe it will become an industry standard. Um, but I, I, I don't need anything specific there, so a meme is as good as anything. I just need something to distinguish between a server and not a server, right? Okay, so... Yeah, sorry, playing with scissors, don't have commands set up, but... I figure I'm doing the lazy load approach to my... Uh, Twitch messages. If if I end up having to post links to my notebook too many times, I'll probably make a notes command. Can I show us how to set up Ninja Pipeline? Oh, that's super easy. Um, all, you, all you need is this CMake Tools extension. It's really cool because what it does, it plugs right into VS Code and all you need to do is open a project that has a CMake list, that, which is the hard part, so bear with me. Um, granted, you already have a CMake list for your code. When you um, open a project and you have the CMake tools, it'll ask you, hey, do you want it to um, configure your project? And it will actually configure a Ninja pipeline completely automatically. Like, I didn't know, I don't know anything about Ninja, and yet um, just having that extension there and having a CMake list, and then I did like CMake configure, it sets up the pipeline and then I hit F7 and it's running Ninja. So it's all it's all pretty pretty well covered if you use the CMake Tools plugin. Now that being said, it does require the CMake uh what did I call what was it called? CMake Tools does require that you have use CMake and CMake can be kind of intimidating to people. But but to give you some hope, let me show you if you were to start out with a very basic project, which I had. Where did I put it? Under projects. Uh, intro to CPP. That's literally all you need to make a Hello World program is a one-liner CMake list that just says add executable, the name of the program, and the name of the source file. That's all you need. You put that in a folder along with Hello World.cpp, run VS Code with CMake tools, and it'll make the whole pipeline for your Hello World program. It's pretty cool. So there's a lot between, obviously, there's a lot between that and this. It's, it's just a learning curve you have to accept if you want to use CMake. The, the, there's some valuable things you get out of it, though. This CMake list works on Windows, Linux, Mac, and there's only a few things where I had to say if it's you do something special if it's uh, Windows. Um, I think it's actually all in this one file. So, yeah, you, you only need about 125 lines to capture all the differences between OSs, and then each of your individual modules will have a pretty simple CMake list that just say what your source files are, um, where to put it in the, if you use an IDE, what folder to put it in, where you put your um, header files, and what your dependencies are, what to link with, and then um, if you have unit tests, to uh, link it into C tests. So that's all you need. Uh, once you get over that hump of understanding the C make syntax, it's all pretty automatic and cool. 
So, bot. Oh, what bot? What bot do you have playing with scissors? Did you make bot land bot? You do use CMake though. Oh, so if you already do use CMake, yeah, just uh, try it out with the CMake tools plug in the VS Code it, and see if it works. It ought to just set up the Ninja pipeline right away for you. It won't do the Ninja thing. Well, I do that too. I I also use it to make uh, VCX proj and SLN files. It's just a different generator. Actually, if you want to do this in the command line, let's see if this works. So I should be able to just make a new directory. It's called build ninja. I should be able to just say CMake, make me one with the ninja, and see what it does. Okay, oh, didn't like it. Uh, okay, let me run help and see what it is. I'd say it's ninja. Oh, okay. So I guess you have to be... Yeah, you have to know where your C compiler and C++ compiler is set. So maybe it's not so easy to set up on the command line. The thing is, I think CMake Tools figures out the settings for where it finds your compiler for you and so it, it does a bit of that lifting for you so you could still you could do it manually you just have to supply the the paths to find the compilers i think uh but yeah the the running cmake with a different generator option is where you want to go for that okay all right the the Warning I was getting, the reason why it's going to continue to fail, and that's because this is not returning the right thing. We need to return the thing we just made. Other instances, right? Hey! It's working! It's awesome. I get suspicious when things work that f fast, and so I like to sabotage my own test to make sure it's not falsely passing. It's a good sabotage issue. Just add a hack one letter out of your data, and it should fail. Yeah, it failed spectacularly. In fact, it, um, oh, it failed because it went out of range in the map. The runtime library is saying, hey, you, you uh, did something to the map you shouldn't have. Actually, looks like I did something really bad, like I got... Oh, it's, it couldn't find it in the map, and I dereferenced an iterator. Yeah, I think I know what that is, but yeah. So, the test was successful. Put it back. should pass. So, I think I had just two more tests, and then I'll wrap up the stream. So, prop redundant instance connections. Okay, that's easy to do, I think. Actually, I think that already does that because just the nature of the code I wrote, right? I told it to just um, give me a reference to it. Oh, it's going to be second one wins, though. So if, when you get a rec if we get the instance record and there already is a WebSocket there, we're going to drop the old one and store the new one. So it'll be the second connection object coming in kind of is kept and the old one is discarded. And I don't know. Maybe that's okay. Yeah, so let's let's keep it simple. So this test, we'll just make a, a test for it, and it should just pass right away. But just in case it breaks later, we want this. So we want to set up one connection. So we move that to here, and then we kind of want to have it set up another connection. So let's name them one and two. Right? This will be two. So yeah, unfortunately a lot of this code is going to be this. Actually not all of it, just some of it. This part of the code is different because we have different a different connection, a different WebSocket. And we say, hey, here's another connection, right? And uh, so what we expect is we should get, um, we don't need to retest these. What we should expect is that it matches WebSocket 2 right now, not 1. 
right? So that should actually pass right away. And we can, I'll sabotage it to say expect one. Yeah, see it, yeah, it, it passed. So if, if we wanted to say that the first connection stays and it just ignores the second connection, then it wouldn't work right now because it's um, drop, not drop, it's, it's the wrong connection that it's, it's holding, right? It's showing us the raw pointer there. So I'm going to just uh, keep it simple and say, instead of drop redundant instance, well, actually that's generic enough where it doesn't imply which one we're dropping. I'll be more specific. Uh, keep, only keep la latest. Hold on a sec, I'm going to mute for a sec. That was someone else coming home. So yeah, people are starting to come home, so got to wrap up soon. Yeah, so I just ma made the name of the test match more precisely what I'm expecting. Only keep the la latest, re re latest redundant. Okay, that's fine. So the last test of today, drop disconnected instance connections. Okay, cool. We will steal from, the, from one of these tests where we set up one. And so we move the act into the arrange and the act is we drop the connection. So that's orc connection break, a broken delegate to tell that the connection has been broken. False means it's not a clean break. So it's a, a, a immediate ter termination of the socket. And by the way, if you want to know the difference between a, a clean socket disconnect and an unclean one, uh, it, it's pretty subtle. A lot of times people don't, don't care and they just do the unclean, you know, immediate close the socket. But if you want to have like a nice handshake at the end of a socket connection, you, it's, it, it's a bit of a hand, yeah, like I said, a bit of a handshake where you, you, you tell the other end of the socket, hey, I'm done sending. So it's a close with an indicator that you're, you're still open to receiving, but you're done sending. And the other side sees that and then they do the same thing. And at that point, the either side can uh, finish the close and be guaranteed not to have lost any data that the other guy had sent at the end. This though, it's immediate. And if there's anything in the OS's buffer, you lose it, right? You lose whatever might've been sent that you haven't read out of the buffer yet. Okay. Yeah, this, we don't need to double, this is redundant, right? So what we're going to expect is that it went to zero. All right, no, no connections left. So, of course, this is going to fail, right? Because we're not uh, handling that right. Yeah, let me do the filter thing. Drop disconnected. Right, so it's still one. We expect a zero. So fortunately, it's not that hard. We already have a closed delegate on the WebSocket. What we're doing is we're just dropping it from the unidentified connection. So in addition to this, I suppose what's best is that we find, well, it's going to be a little less clean than I would like because I picked map, right? So we're going to have to iterate through the map to find the instance record whose web socket matches the one that just closed. So I'll, I'll, I'll clean this up later. Remember the, the principles, make it work first then make it right, then make it fast. So we're just gonna make it work first. So to do that, we're going to iterate. So for auto coordinator entry, co no, not coordinator entry. Uh, what do I call it? Other instance entry. I like to use the word entry for iterator. Some people call it iterator. Actually, I could just call it it. Because I'm, because why do we need a long name? Auto it equals coordinator other instances, other instances dot begin, right? And then auto of co comma, auto end. Uh, no, we can just say it not equal to, and then 
this dot end, right? So it 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 might it might get, get it might make you cringe the way I um my indentation style. I'm sorry if it does, but it's just uh for me it just looks nicer that I don't have all three conditions on the same line. Also, uh, it 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 keeps it all together. Uh, don't have to scroll to the right. So what we want to say if it second dot oh, misspelled that. Come on, editor. Okay, ws equal, well, really it's more natural to say if the one we just closed. No, no. This feels better. Could go either way, though. If we found it, then for now, all we need to do is drop it. So we'll probably want to do more later. So we're just going to erase it. And that probably returns something. Yeah, it returns the next iterator. We don't care. We're just going to break out. So that ought to be good enough uh, to simply just drop the connection. There we go. So there you have it. So again, test-driven development, it's not completely correct. It's only as correct as my test case, my, my yeah, um, use cases that I've listed. And obviously these are not correct because they have not even written them yet. But um, as far as these use cases, the code is correct. I'll, I'll want to add more test cases, and I'll even want to go review, code review my code. And if I see something that I'm obviously doing wrong, what I want to try to, you know, when you train yourself to do test-driven development, the first the thing you want to go towards is, what is the use case that would result in this code not doing the right thing? And then you make the test out of that use case, and then you make the test pass, and now your code is closer to being completely correct. And so it's an iterative process. And um, I like it because I'm, I'm building a foundation that's in, and a base that's always in, getting better and better of it's both documenting use cases and it's allowing me to add features incrementally. So I don't have, when I add, when I added this connection between realm servers, it's not, they're not doing all that they need to do, but they're doing enough to satisfy all, enough uh, the features as I've gotten them in so far. So I hope that makes sense. Oh, wow. Thanks for subscribing, Paja Gunnett. Or Papa Gunnett. I'm sorry for butchering the name. Very, very generous to subscribe. So, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope this was uh, interesting, fun. I, I don't expect it, but I hope it. And I um, hope you guys come back later. I'm going to be wrapping up. I'll do a little uh, run through of what I did cover today and, and estimate of what I'll be working on next. And then we'll go, I guess we'll, how many viewers do we have? Either raid or host, depending on who we have here. Uh, sorry. Okay, we got a decent size following. Maybe we, I'll go see, find one of the people that you might not know and uh, introduce you to them through a host. So let's one first things first, right? Yeah, please send me the feedback, playing with scissors. I I can't wait to be grilled. So um, in my last job, I uh, did not receive enough feedback, and that's the most frustrating thing I think is when when you're doing something wrong so long, and you think that you're doing everything good, and then you find out I don't know at your your performance review that someone said yeah, I hate to read that guy's code because it I can't stand how how gross his code is. And you're like, man, I wish they had told me like early on. So the feedback is always, I cringe a little bit when people, I know that people are going to give me feedback, but um, it's always a good thing in the end. And uh, I want to hear it sooner than later because I, I hate the idea of doing something wrong for a long time and people just not wanting to tell me. Okay, let me catch up on chat a little bit because I missed some stuff. I'm sorry that uh, I was not able to catch up and, and interact with the memes playing with scissors. I hope you don't uh, get uh, frustrated that I don't respond to them all. <laughs> I, actually, I was in the back of my mind. I was thinking there's probably someone else from Adam's chat that can that can interact with the memes uh, and uh, the conversation, so that I don't have to pay full attention to it. But. Uh, Oh, you wish there was a such thing for human conversations? I'm done talking. 
you can say whatever and I will read, but I won't reply. <laughs> you know, that might work between two programmers because they would understand that, right? Okay. What game cheat is it? I connected. I'm not sure I understand the question, but it's not a game cheat. I'm making, actually making my own game very early in the process and we're just, just setting up some servers. They don't do anything yet. And, uh, um, You'll see more of the game in the weeks and months to follow if you come back in a couple of months. There's probably going to be more of it. And, uh, yeah. Not a game cheat, it's a real game. Hopefully. So, yeah, and thanks for following, Papaganit, and thanks for the sub again. Multi-line fours. Yeah, you know what the, the biggest piece of feedback I got that I'm still working on? is stuff like this. This is horrible. And I, I think I said it while I was writing it. I'm like, this is getting to the point where it's begging to be refactored. And I, I accept that. So, um, the thing is I, while I was writing it, I felt it would be a little bit too distracting to go immediately break these out as functions, but yeah, they need to be, I will do that. Definitely. And thanks for following connected. So yeah. Uh, okay. So let me, Oh, I haven't checked in in a long time, like as in an hour. Check in early and often, right? It's probably a lot of features I added. Let's see. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. Well, you know what? I'm just going to accept defeat and I'm going to make an Uber check in. I usually like to make commits that are distinct incremental steps, but I'm going to bite the bullet here and say I failed. So we'll say a more generic message coordinator. And what's the, what's the overall theme? I think the overall theme is connecting to other instances. Uh, work in, work in progress, interacting or connecting, accepting connections, really accepting connections. No, there's more because I have use cases I haven't filled in yet. Right. Work in progress, connecting with peers. There we go. So we'll say, we'll just list the features that we added that yeah, we as a community, you helped me, right? Provided moral support if nothing else. Okay. Right. Uh, recognize and, and hold onto connections from other realm servers. Okay. And, uh, don't hold multiple connections to the same realm server. And then what else do we do? All uh, right. Drop connections uh, to Realm servers when connections are broken. Actually, I can just say drop broken connections. Drop broken Realm serve Realm server connections. I see chat, but need to finish my thought. Hold on, hold on. The last one was. I'm not going to talk about the extra use cases, but the last one was add ID to, uh, what are we calling this? Identification messages to distinguish orchestrator from other realm servers. Okay. So let me catch up on, uh, chat. Can you make some games like APB Reloaded? I don't know APB Reloaded, but uh, I want to know what you mean. So let me let me look this up. What's APB Reloaded? Hopefully this is something safe for me to search. That probably not because of the graphics. So I didn't mention it before, but um, how best to explain it? I'm not a very good artist and I'm, I'm a beginner in terms of graphics libraries. So my, f my goal for my game right now is to make a picks, a low, low red, low fi, this is the right word, low fi pixel art game. Almost like actually not almost, but very retro. So old, old, old retro games, like the one I really enjoyed, and this is going to uh, sort of reveal how old I am, but I really liked playing Ultima three and four. So 
if I could recreate that app, that kind of a game, but in a multiplayer evolving, ever changing world with a lot more content, that's going to be it. So it's not going to be on the order of uh, like realistic graphics, like APB Reloaded or any of those other games. So yeah, sorry if uh, that's not your kind of game. There's lots of stuff out there. Today I made nothing but commits with message BK327 because I asked to interrupt my work once an hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like, well, if, if you stream while you're coding, you're interrupted constantly. So maybe playing with scissors, you need to stream and then you'll get used to being interrupted. Can't it? Well, maybe it can hurt, but I've learned from experience now that if you want to learn how to deal with interruption, be a streamer. Interrupted constantly. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to say here. We're holding on to connections from other Realm servers. And that's it. We're just holding on to them. And we're letting them go when they disconnect. So it, I think we're good to go. And then just in case I accidentally touch some other repository, I'm going to run my tool that kind of iterates through my other repositories to make sure I didn't... Okay, I didn't have any other changes, so that's good. Well, thanks for following, Kalak. Hold on a sec. And if you haven't seen it, that uh, that the overlay happens when I have to mute the mic. And hey, Irish John Gaming. You know... I always get rated right when I'm wrapping up my stream. I'm, I'm wondering how often this happens, but I'm really sad to say that I was just wrapping up. But uh, I will extend a little bit to talk about what I'm doing so that if it sounds interesting to you, you can come back tomorrow or hopefully tomorrow, next time I stream, if this is interesting to you. But uh, thanks for the raid. I will, I will talk about what I was doing today and what I plan to be doing tomorrow. And um, if you like it, come back. If not, that's fine too. And so what I'm I doing, I have a OneNote notebook and it, I will link it. I have a page for every time I stream and you can see I've streamed 72 times at least. Occasionally I will cover uh, playtesting other games like Adam's Botland, but most of the time I'm working on building up my own stuff. I like to write stuff from scratch. So last 70 streams have been bits and pieces of web server. So if I go to this page, all the little nit bolts and pieces that you need to make your own web server, basic web service structure I I've been doing. And I reached the point where I want to do something fun with it. Initially I had made a chat room. I made a Twitch chat bot with it, uh, but only so much you can do with that. And I like, I always wanted to make a game and what better way to learn how than to actually try to do it and do it live and have people uh, yell at you that you're doing it wrong and all that fun stuff. So, and it, I should say disclaimer, it's not completely from scratch because there are some things I cannot do. There are a lot of things I cannot do. So uh, I took a break from Twitch for about a month because I didn't really know anything at all about server infrastructure and how to set up uh, things on AWS and there was a it was a big transition so I didn't stream for a month and now I'm back this is like the second day of stream and it's in a new direction I'm trying to make a game out of it and the game is called Omnia Regnia it doesn't exist yet it it, it it it's Latin for all realms so the idea is I want to take an old school retro game I really enjoyed the prototype I always think of back to that I've mentioned several times is Ultima 3 Ultima 4 that kind of experience, but make it multiplayer online, constantly evolving, people adding stuff to the game all the time, make it sandbox where you can, there's lots of different things you can do in the game. And since it's multiplayer, lots of inter different interaction. And so my focus to get started with the foundation is to set up a server side infrastructure that can handle such a thing. So Adam13531 has been a real good inspiration for this. He's actually working on a lot of his back-end server stuff right now. And one thing he uh, helped me learn more about was the Raft consensus algorithm. So you have, for fault tolerance and replication, you have many instances of your game server. So each one of these will have its own copy of the game. And they'll all keep basically in agreement by having um, lots of interaction with each other. And 
any one of these Realm servers your client could connect to and run the game. And just setting up that infrastructure right now. So I was working on the very first beginnings of this today. Each of these Realm servers will have the complete server side uh, snapshot and everything about the game, have all the game logic in it. Uh, I have an orchestrator just to make sure there are the correct number of Realm servers running and that they have uh, been told to start or stop. It doesn't really do much other than that. And the client will be in the browser, JavaScript, uh, probably with either Pixie.js or, was it Phaser? That's what Adam was telling me to look into. Look into Phaser as an alternative. So we're just starting up, and let's see if I, I... I'm not very good with Twitch chat, so if you don't see me respond to chat right away, either tag me or uh, be patient a little bit, and I scroll back in text and I see what I might have missed. So what did I miss? I missed a bunch of follows. AEWS is a no-go zone for you. I'm, I'm trying to keep the implementation dependencies to a minimum, so I could take this, and if I learned Azure... If I learn Google Cloud, I could probably run it there too. Yeah, alternatives from AWS. Alternative to AWS would be like yeah, Azure or Google Cloud or something like that. So I'm I'm not coding in anything that requires AWS. I just need some kind of place to run multiple servers. And AWS was just something that other people I know use, and so I could get help from them. Why not T Black Book? I'm not sure what that is. Oh, John is raiding AWS. I'm not sure what you mean. What what does that mean, raiding AWS? Maestro card. Is that a thing or is that a meme? Don't know Maestro card. Did I miss anything else? So I hope that gives you a overview of what I plan to do, what I, where I am. I'm very early stages of setting up a game, setting up the actual servers to run the game. Oh, I should show what is inside this box. So last 70 streams, like 220 hours, some, some number like that, I've been developing my own web server. Now I'm putting it into use. It's going to connect in. If you can think of the top as the outside world and the bottom as the actual state of the game, the game will be... Uh, basically one or more worlds, and each world has one or more zones. Zones have places, places have entities, the player, monsters, items, etc. Some entities have dialogue, scripting, and all, all of these things can have logic associated with them, can have what I call effect is like something that's triggered based off of a, uh, an event that happens in the game. So if an event happens and something has an attached effect, and I don't maybe I don't know what I'm doing, but this is this is what I was working on in a previous iteration of the game that was not multiplayer. So I kind of pulled this part in, and I'm adding to it the the concept of a journal because you need like a journal or a log to fit in to uh, replication and uh, and clustering. So the idea is that to keep multiple servers in sync, you um, your game state is only updated through a journal. It's like a journaling file system, like a, a sequence of records that say what to do with what thing in the game, like move your character to the left or spawn an item, right? Each of those would be journal entries. The servers using um, the consensus algorithm will make sure that all servers stay in sync with that. And also if any server, if all the servers crash, the game state can be recovered by replaying the journal entries one by one until you recover the game state. And then um, because requests to change the game state come from different clients from other servers, I'll, I plan to have a component that will reconcile the differences, like figure out how they yep. figure out how they uh, fit together, maybe deny some of them because they conflict. And then um, what I've been working on today is the, the thing that's on top of that, which is just the... The, I call it the coordinator. It's the component that's uh, making connections between servers and accepting connections from clients and kind of recognizing who's who and directing um, messages if they're allowed to the right place. So that's pretty much it. It's very vague at this point because it's very new. But hopefully you get the idea of what I've been doing. And today, like I said, there's a page for every day. So if you come back tomorrow... 
and you want to see if this stuff is horribly boring or might be interesting, you can just look at the plan. I try to set up this part before I stream so you can see, oh, he's working on that. And if you missed some streams, you can kind of glance through and see what you might have missed. And yeah, today was I was just setting up that coordinator object you just saw to accept WebSocket connections because I, I already had the WebSocket stuff done from the previous streams, and now the coordinator's got to work with that. And uh, we pretty much finished it, although I don't have outward connections going, so them to have to have them actually connect to servers isn't quite happening. But I kind of ran out of time. That's probably what I'll do next stream, is we'll work at having the Realm servers actually like initiate connections to each other, and then they'll form that uh, that 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 cluster, and that'll be the basis for implementing the consensus algorithm. And I'll I'll show that again. But there are, there are links to that if you look in my notes for server ideas. The Raft consensus algorithm, and uh, as a starting point, let me put a, a link there. So if you're interested, I'm going to be trying to follow this as a way of forming my own server cluster and keeping the state of the game consistent. And it, it kind of introduces some of the other concepts like the journal, which they call the log, and how you... Um, um, the actual game state and how you, you can represent it through, they call it snapshots or games, or uh, they call it, it's more generic, like server state. For me, the server is the game, so it's my server state is the game state. So I'll, I'll be working tomorrow on actively getting the coordinators from different instances, like these connections formed and into the, the correct network. And then from there, I'll probably be implementing as much as I can of Raft to, to the, the idea in Raft is one of these servers has got to be the leader. It's the one that makes the ultimate decisions about what the game state is. It can uh, reject entries and or rewrite them. And I'm thinking, for now at least, in, the, the leader will also be the one that binds the well-known port. So that um, you have to have a well-known port because when, when someone starts your game from the very first, uh, they have no state on their end, the only thing they know is um, the the URL for your web server, right? So it's the host name and the port number. So it's going to be a two-stage process because first you got to load the JavaScript down. Then that JavaScript has got to say, well, let's connect to the well-known backend for it. Once we're connected to that, we can ask that server, well, well if, if what are the other ports in case we need to go to a different server, like if this one crashes? Um, so there has to be that well-known port uh, as like the, the way you, you learn discover the rest of the system. So we need only one server can do that, so we have to have a designated leader and the raft algorithm is the way to go for that, I think. And we'll be working on that tomorrow. So are there any questions before I wrap things up? Let's see if I missed anything. AWS has a Twitch stream, I didn't know that. Let me bookmark that. I might watch the oops, I didn't mean to open that window. That was my Visual Studio window. Let me use Visual Studio if the um, debugger integration in uh, VS Code is, is falls short. Oops. I would like this to default to keep text only, please. I don't know why it bolded it. What else did I miss? Company type of system there, badly. Oh, thanks for following Tim Pergens. Playing with scissors, I eagerly await your feedback. Oh, by the way, anyone else has feedback? Let's see, how would you give it to me? I have a Discord. There's no one there yet, um, but it's there if people want to log in and ask me questions. You could always, let's see. I have a lot of my stuff is in GitHub, so if you have a question about or a problem with any of the components I have, you feel free to post there. And I don't have a Discord link. Let me, for the people who are on mobile, I should get just grab my own link, right? What's the best way to do that? Probably just to go to my own channel and get it. Professional streamer here, by the way. I don't know if you noticed. I'm so good at this, it's not funny. Shoot. I'm so good at this. Ah, no, no. Mute. Shoot. What am I doing? Okay. Sorry about that. There's a little bit of an echo. All right. There's the Discord link. So playing with scissors, have at it. Or you can ask me in Adam's chat too, or direct discard me. That's fine too. So 
I think that's going to wrap it up until tomorrow. So who's on that we could uh, go host? Anybody has suggestions, let me know. Oh, uh, Lucky No 7 is going. Maybe we'll go host him. Let me, let me peek and see what he's doing. Oh, his stream is ending. Oh, shucks, we missed him. Hmm. Oh, uh, Mike in principle is going. He let me beta, uh, beta test or play test his game yesterday, which was really fun. Let's see if he's still going. He is. I think we will go visit him. So here's his link. We're going to go host Mike in principle. He's working on uh, arcade platformer. He let me play test yesterday. I thought it was really fun. And he's actually looking for beta testers. So we'll take a look. See if he's um see what he's up to. And yeah, hope to see you guys next time if this is interesting. If not, that's fine too. And uh hope you guys have a good morning, evening, etc. etc. And I will see you guys later. Bye bye. <laughs>